I'm going to call this meeting of the Gloucester School Committee to order. I'll remind everybody that the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. This meeting is recorded by video and audio in accordance with the state open meeting law, consistent with the governor's orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and banning gatherings of more than 25 people. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation. If you are calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or device, there is a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to be recognized to speak. So Maria, I'll ask for, uh, for a roll call for attendance. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Here. Kathy Clancy. Present. Mr. Favaza. I don't see him yet. Chairman Pope. Here. And Ms. Prince. Here. Okay. Oral communications. Um, the public shall have the opportunity at every regular school committee meeting to be heard under oral communications. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to school committee business to appear before the school committee, state their problem without debate, and the matter may be referred to the proper subcommittee. For items that are on the agenda, members of the public may address the committee with the permission of the chair. Persons speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes and shall submit a copy of their prepared communication to the recording secretary. The school committee chair shall not allow complaints as to the individual performance or character. Uh, that being said, um, we will open it up for oral communications. Um, I have one person's hand uh, raised and it's uh, listed as Heather. So um, Heather, I'm gonna allow you to, well, I can't allow you to speak. Maria's gotta let me uh, be able to do that. I'm sorry, uh, Jonathan, I'll do that right now. Okay. Um, and. Uh, okay, you're all set. Okay, great. So Heather, uh, please identify yourself um, and uh, welcome. Hi, good evening. Are you able to hear me? We are. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. I am just hoping that tonight an update on the remote academy might be provided. Um, I, I know often that it's been said more information will be forthcoming, but we haven't received anything at this time yet. So I'm, I'm just hoping that that information will be addressed tonight. And if there are particular barriers to the remote academy happening, um, that's things that parents should be aware of for planning purposes, um, it would be also nice to know what those barriers to the remote academy are um, so that parents at, at this point, school being four business days away, um, you know, parents could have some opportunity to start thinking about plan, different plans in their head. Um, so I would just appreciate any updates and any information. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you, Heather. Um, that um, I believe will be touched on tonight, but that being said, we are in negotiations with the uh, Gloucester Teachers Association and we will be meeting tomorrow night, which will be um, public meeting. Um, and it is our hope um, that we will resolve all of the contractual issues around um, uh, the remote academy tomorrow night. So um, as much as we know what we'd like to see happen, we, we still don't have um, complete agreement with the uh, teachers union. So um, stay tuned, we're doing the best we can. Um, is there anybody else? Um, um, oral communications, we have 95 attendees at this moment, which um, 
I would just like to touch on again is that uh, our attendance uh, during these um, these Zoom meetings far exceeds by by exponentially by anybody any uh, numbers that we've ever had in person when we have in person meetings. So thank you all for attending, and um, we appreciate uh, the fact that uh, the community is paying attention to what we are working so hard to uh, do. Okay, seeing none, we will move, we'll close oral communications. Um, tonight we are going to get another update on the reopening of schools. Um, tonight uh, we will be, um, we have Karen Carroll, the, the Gloucester's uh, uh, public health agent uh, um, with us tonight to answer some questions. Um, later on, we'll be voting on a, um, a policy about uh, masks. Um, all of these things are important, and uh, I hope um, everybody uh, stays tuned. Um, uh, recognitions. Do we have any recognitions? Joel. Thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of going over to VETS today for the kindergarten screening. And um, Principal Fusco and the staff were great. And I, I just want to highlight that um, during the parent um, presentation, while the children were being screened, um, there were you know parents there who were sending their children remote and parents there who were sending them, their children in person. And at the end of um, Principal Fusco's presentation on you know what the school is going to look like um, to stay COVID compliant. One of the questions from one of the parents was, is it too late for me to switch to in-person because I'm, I'm second guessing my, my choice to go remote now that I've seen what veterans is gonna have available for my child. So I thought that was a really great you know, response. Um, I just wanted to recognize the, the veteran staff and Principal Fusco for you know, doing the hard work to, to alleviate some parent concerns, at least in one parent that was uh, you know, unwilling to send a child beforehand. Thank you. Any other recognitions, uh, Melissa? Thank you. Um, I just want to recognize um, DPW Director Mike Hale, his assistant Joe Lucido, Brad Cool, the city HVAC guy, and Brendan Leary from Siemens, who spent an hour and a half with us earlier this morning talking about our facilities and the safety of our facilities and all the testing that's going on, the components that are going to be added, um, and having a really good discussion about um, the status of our buildings and what's going on to help ease some um, public um, concerns about going into our buildings. So, I mean, I think their report was really good and look forward to information that's going to be coming out as a result of those conversations this morning and hope that everybody takes a chance to watch that Zoom meeting because there was some good information in there um, about our facilities. Any other recognitions? I, um, I would just like to once again uh, recognize the, uh, the administration and the school, the teachers and uh, DPW was, uh, uh, who are, everybody is just making a Herculean effort to um, do everything they can to assure that we have a, a safe and successful opening of schools a week from today. And, um, I, people are just working night and day and, uh, and, you know, even though they're putting in their hours there, I'm sure they're going home and, and, and thinking about it. So I, I, I know how hard everybody's working on, and I just want to let them know that, that we appreciate it. Um, so that being said, um, let's move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items? On Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Kathy. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I just wanted to specifically call out um, and recognize Greg Bach. Um, when we were closed down in March and we needed Chromebooks being handed out to family after family after family, he was there. Um, and I go in to, to sign the warrant. So plenty of times I saw him there. And I know all the efforts he's made to put all the working groups together this summer. And I know so many people are putting in so many hours, so I don't want to highlight one person at the expense of any other. Um, I just want to say that I, you know, I could see firsthand a real roll up your sleeves and, and pitch in um, wherever and whenever it was needed. Um, so I just, uh, I appreciate that, that attitude as it relates to making sure our kids can be learning when it's a difficult situation. 
any other recognitions. That being said, let's move on to the um, consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that anybody would like to remove for further discussion or consideration? Joel. Yeah, thank you. I think it was, Ian is scrolling back up now. Um, it was, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was acceptance of uh, donation and gifts. I'll just pull those out so we can talk about those. Both of them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so we have uh, um, two, um, we have two um, uh, gifts and donations. Um, the first one is E1. Uh, which is donation of $350 from Susanna Natty for the Robert Natty Story Corner in memory of her father, Robert Natty. The East Gloucester Elementary School is the recipient this year. Um, Joel, do you, would you like to? Yeah, so I, I suppose the focus is really on E2, so I'm... I, I'm okay. Well, I'll have, I, I'd like to say something about E1 because um, I've been on the school committee forever. Um, and um, Robert Natty was um, a principal at Gloucester High School. When I was there, he was the guidance counselor. Um, he spent his entire career um, working for the Gloucester uh, school systems. He was um, uh, a, a fabulous um, pr pr uh, guidance counselor and principal, and his family has um, dedicated this uh, money to go to purchase of books um, for each of the elementary schools. It rotates through the five schools, uh, one every year, and they have been uh, absolutely faithful every year in donating this money. Um, and, um, I, you know, it's, this is not a, a foundation. This is a family that is just doing this in memory of their father. And um, it's, it's admirable. And I hope the money is well spent. Um, and uh, this year, um, $350 uh, to East Gloucester School. So I'd like to um, see if we could um, perhaps send a thank you letter to uh, Susanna Natty and her family. So E2 is a donation of three uh, sets of preschool tables with two chairs each set. Uh, $29 each set, totaling $89.97. Um, and I got to look to see who this is. Um, uh, from. Um, this is, it just says from uh, Anne, Anne Marie has passed this on. Uh, these are parents uh, who have sent we um, sent this in. Joel? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously I want to express appreciation and I'm just curious um, if there's, you know, if there's a need in the district for things like this, especially given the reconfiguration of classrooms and the need for, you know, whereas maybe one classroom used to have four sets of an item and that was enough for everyone. Now they need 15 sets of it. So everyone has their own individual set. Um, I would love to know if, if um, we could add to our back to school website or something similar, um, you know, kind of a list of, of what would be helpful because I'm speaking to other parents and other business owners. I think there's, you know, a, a will out there to, to help. And again, you know, $90 isn't nothing. That's, you know, a few tanks of gas and some groceries, but it's, you know, it's not $9,000 worth of tables. There's a lot of people who can come up with, you know, $90 worth of tables that I think would like to do that. And so I would just, Again, thank whoever sent these in very much and just see if we can get something out there that says, hey, if you have the ability to do something small like this, it would be helpful without, you know, being so broad that the wrong things get ordered and sent in and can't be used, you know? Okay. Well, I, I believe that's probably very helpful. I think uh, there are a number of things that people can use. Um, um, I the administration is, is clearly doing um, their due diligence to make sure that we have everything that we, that we absolutely need, but there are probably a lot of things that people would like to have um, that we- Right, and we heard today from the DPW director, for instance, like, please don't send in 
Clorox wipes because we're <laughs> cleaning, right? But people just think they're doing a, a big favor. It's like, oh, I bought a whole case of Clorox wipes for my second grader's teacher. Is that a nice thing I've done? And the DPW director's going, oh, actually, you know, there may have been a, a better way to spend that money. You know what I'm trying to say? So just some guidance as to if you want to help, here are the things we need that are beyond what we've already pulled in ourselves. I think it would be great. All right. So um, there was no reason to pull either of those items from the consent agenda. It was just a question of, of uh, um, highlighting them. So um, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with um, both of the E1 and E2 uh, included? Second. Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be moving on to the next item on our agenda, which is deliberations on educational issues. Um, and we have tonight um, uh, the superintendent's update uh, on the plans for school reopening and reentry, which is what we have every week. Um, but we also have Karen Carroll here from the, the Department of Health uh, to um, uh, give us uh, an update on information uh, regarding uh, public health. Um, I would just like to point out to people that uh, may not know this, we had a meeting earlier today uh, at 10 o'clock where we got a report uh, from the DPW director, as well as uh, the consultants from Siemens about um, basically about the condition of the buildings and the, uh, in particular, the air handling and um, air um, uh, uh, movement um, uh, capacity of, of our buildings. And if you'd like to review that, it was very informative and um, it's, uh, should be available sometime tomorrow uh, on the city's website uh, if you go to the IT department and look up uh, past meetings um, you can you can hear that so that being said um, Superintendent Lummis I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you Jonathan I'll, I'll just give a brief uh, intro to things and then get to uh, Miss Carroll uh, so she can give us an update I'm going to share my screen a thumbs up if you can see that. Great, thank you. So um, yet another school committee update on getting back together. Um, so I, as I always start, our primary objective continues to be our safe return of as many students as possible to in-person school settings. So we can mac maximize learning, address our students' full needs, and also support community and family needs. Um, as we've kept on saying that, um, you know, some of the, the basic principles for planning are that we know that we can address best serve our students academic, social, emotional and mental health needs when they're in our schools with our teachers and staff. Um, as we continue to say, our decisions need to be based on facts, science and data. And in particular, on the situation in Gloucester and our surrounding communities. Um, and so I think we've just been doing, doing a great job understanding what's happening locally. And you'll hear, hear more about that from uh, Karen Carroll. Uh, just a, a real acknowledgement that we are, we will strengthen remote learning and we'll give an update today uh, about the remote learning academy. Um, but remote learning can never fully replace our in-person instruction. There's a reason we've been doing in-person school for many years. Um, and that's because the strength and um, experience and wisdom uh, of our teachers and our counselors and support staff and paraprofessionals and principals and so many other folks uh, really, really make a difference in their kids' lives when they're working with them face-to-face. -face. Um, and then also we'll talk about a little bit about just the idea that um, there's risk related to COVID, but there's also a, a wide, wider variety of risks, which certainly Karen Carroll, the school committee, many others have impressed upon me. Um, and that's the, uh, um, those are the, you know, very various reasons for making sure we can serve our students in school. So um, we've been, as we have from the beginning, continue to base our guidance on um, the Department of Education and the state public health guidance, um, and particularly on the local community, on our local community's health data as well. Um, just to, I'll give you a quick community health update, but Karen Carroll can go into more detail on this because she knows more about it than I do. There are five active cases in Gloucester now of COVID-19. 
that's um, remained steady um, for a while now. Um, the statewide positivity rate for COVID tests is 0.9%, uh, which is the lowest it's been since the start of COVID. Uh, that's good news. We are uh, currently graded green on the state map from last week. Haven't seen the new one as well, new new one yet. Um, as we'll continue to say that, and uh, community transmission is our key metric. Um, and as it remains low, uh, it is safe to reopen school in Gloucester um, and safe to continue with uh, in-person learning as much as in-person or hybrid learning as much as possible. Um, and we will always look closely at that, remain uh, up to date on it. Uh, work with the Department of Health on it, make sure the community knows how things are changing, if they're changing, and then make decisions to um, go to a different type of uh, learning model uh, as necessary. Um, that, but that'll be a very open and public, uh, all that information as we've been doing. So just to see how the statewide map has changed. So remember, this came out a few weeks ago. Uh, at the beginning, we were, we were white, then they changed the colors a little bit. Um, we became a green community, green, from the Department of Education says that's a community that should be um, primarily in person and in some situations be, be hybrid. Um, remained in green last week, as you can see, uh, at that point, um, other communities around us were becoming more, they were becoming more and more gray communities around us. So, but that, this can change. Um, what's very important, and Karen Carroll may talk more about this, but just to give you an intro on it, Department of Education and Department of Public Health are strongly urging communities not to act just on one week of that data. So that if the map changes colors, that there aren't knee jerk reactions to change a model immediately. Um, that's because the data and those measures are very sensitive because they have very low thresholds, quite low thresholds to shift from one um, say color to the next. Um, but then also that they need to be made not just on that one piece of data, but all other data that's happening in our local community, in our schools, and really working closely in conjunction with the local health department. So it's nice to have a map and sort of red, green, you know, yellow uh, stoplight colors, um, but it also is simplifying things quite a bit. Um, and the Department of Health, Department of Education really want us to be communicating to folks as to, you know, use that uh, one piece of data wisely, but don't overreact to it. Um, otherwise we'll be going back and forth, back and forth, we may be going back and forth, back and forth all year long. So. Um, and just again, a reminder about the, this balanced view of risk that there is the COVID-19 risk in our community. Um, it's low right now, thank goodness, because of all the great work our community has been doing. But there's also other risks to our families and our, and our students, and that's loss of learning, that's impact of being isolated socially, that's an emotional impact and mental health, that's nutritional insecurity, which many of our families face, loss of parental employment and the difficulty families have in um, you know, keeping uh, employment and um, uh, when they are uh, need to be at home as well. And that just that challenge families face uh, when school uh, is being done remotely or is in session. Um, family uh, concerns, heightened family uh, concerns about abuse, uh, but then also lack of essential, essential services to many of our families. So this is a balanced view of approach. And just to highlight that COVID is one risk, but we also face our community, our families face other risks as well. And we need to balance those as we go forward. So just some of the basics that we've been reiterating for since the beginning of the summer about the need for, you know, and why, and um, we're trying to get in-person learning and what we're basing it on. So um, I'll hand it off to Karen Carroll, the director of the Gloucester Department of Health, and she'll give us an update on local community transmission, um, sewage testing, uh, and, and the recent data you asked about that last week. She'll provide some input on masks and face coverings um, so uh, to help your de deliberation later tonight and then also talk about physical distancing as just one part of a complete safety approach and then she'll be available for some questions and answers so Karen I'll take this off the screen and and hand it over to you thanks hey everyone Thanks again for having me. Um, and we'll just, I'll quickly go through some of those four topic areas that Ben mentioned. And then if you have some questions, I'm happy to take them. I did get a few questions today emailed, so I'll cover those as well. Uh, just discussing the incidence map, the map that Ben just referred to, um, that's got a lot of communities kind of jumping and, and what should we do here? Um, I just want to remind people that's that's an incidence map. So it's reporting new cases over 
It's taking an average number of new cases per day over a 14 day period, um, and then equating it to a population of 100,000. So again, it's just our incidence. So we're seeing one to two new cases every day, and it's just enough to average us at that um, level to make us green. We're also losing one to two cases every day. So what this map is not, is it's not prevalence. It's not showing you the total amount of COVID or the total number of cases in that 14 day period. Because um, again, some will come off out of quarantine or their cases will be done and some come on each day. And that's a kind of consistent trend we've had all summer. We're sitting right around five active cases um, or under five in the last, I would say, couple of months. Uh, we might have had eight, you know, one week or something. But basically, we're sitting at very low numbers through the summer of active cases. So I hope that clarifies a little bit what that map is and what it isn't. Um, again, it's one more data point that I think Ben explained nicely. Uh, we have one person hospitalized at the moment. And to date, we have had 26 deaths due to COVID. Um, we have not had any deaths, um, I don't know the exact number of weeks, but it's been several weeks now where we have not reported any new deaths. So uh, we're really grateful for that. Um, in terms of the local scene and wastewater testing, we are continuing with our contract with BioBot testing. And we did just get our um, report today which actually, let me just go back. We also did just get the new map colorings came in for today, and we have stayed at that same green um, level for this week. Um, the, the wastewater testing is one data point, again, it's, um, and so when people ask for the reports and things, there really aren't reports. There's one, one data point, and it's a count of the number of copies of the virus. The, um, the genomic copies of copy of a virus in the wastewater during that 24 hour sampling. Um, so what we'll provide, and I think Vanessa is starting it today or tomorrow this week, is when we put our weekly statistics up on the city's website, we're going to include the graph from our weekly BioBot reporting because we now have four weeks of data. So at this point, this one data point, you can follow it over time and it will help us all know a little bit more about where we're at in Gloucester from a community-wide level. Like what is the level of virus in our community? So we've established a baseline for this low period of um, low activity, low numbers of cases, and we're sitting right around the level of detection, which is 3,600 um, copies of virus. So we've had, you know, two weeks below that where there's no, 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 it can't be detected. We've had two weeks slightly above it, but we kind of are bouncing right around that over the past month. So we would say that's roughly our baseline and we'll just continue to watch it week by week. Again, and it's one piece of the story. The nice piece is that it tells us the asymptomatic as well as the symptomatic people. So the active cases I reported earlier are only folks who have usually gotten sick enough to go to a doctor, get tested, and get a result. So where the wastewater is showing us everyone. Um, and the other thing that I think important to note about the wastewater is that it stayed relatively low around this level of detection level during these summer months where we've had many, many visitors, hundreds of visitors, and we now get the reports from the travel forms as people file them. So we can see the states and the number of people coming from high risk states, medium risk states, through Gloucester, and it's nothing that you don't know living here. Our summers are full of many, many visitors. So the fact that our wastewater virus levels have stayed fairly low, given the hundreds of visitors from out of state to our beaches, our hotels, our restaurants, is also a good sign. Um, our nursing homes are in very good shape, and both of them are in compliance at this point with the state's new testing requirements. Um, there are, I don't think, any cases in either nursing home now for several weeks. 
Um, our capacity, our public health infrastructure, and our health infrastructure is also very good. Our hospitals have seen a decrease. They saw a slight increase in COVID cases, um, but that has come down. Our, we have approximately a two-day turnaround time for our PCR test for our Gloucester residents, which is very low compared to the spring. Um, our, our ability test. to test and test. our availability of local testing is still the test. same. Uh, it's, um, we don't have testing on Cape Ann other than in the hospital, but we do have facilities we refer to people to, um, and so that is status quo. And our ability to contact trace is also, um, our capacity to do that work is fully up and running and functional. We have plenty of capacity. As many of our nurses went back to school, we have replaced them with a new team or some new members. Um, and we also have the backup of the state at any point should we exceed our local capacity to contact trace, um, we have a team from the state who supports us. And we have that service seven days a week. We have contract tracing available. Um, someone asked in a question earlier today, what the health metrics will be that we monitor that will make the decision or help guide the decision around whether to go remote, hybrid, close, et cetera. Um, we've asked the same question to DESI and the state, and we've been told that there are going to be a series of indicators and maybe even a combined statistic that lumps together a number of data points to give you a, a sort of level of you know, where you're at with your transmission, your risk of staying open, all of that. Um, we haven't seen that yet. Um, we, haven't, you know, we haven't seen anything from the state as to what exactly that will be. But we do have a lot of indicators, many of the ones I just talked about, that we know can correlate to low, moderate, or substantial transmission in a community. And we will monitor those carefully. Um, and again, it won't be a lights on, lights off kind of thing in the community, much like when we ramped up. We'll slowly ramp down, reduce capacity, um, limit, restrict movement of people in the community, um, to, and, you know, and then it escalates as needed if the community transmission becomes substantial and uncontrolled. We sort of follow a little bit what we did last spring um, and maybe a little bit in reverse. Any questions on the local scene at this point? Yes, Laura. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Thank Laura. Thank you. Um, just a question on two things you said, if that's okay. Um, you were saying that, um, and I think Ben also said this, we don't want to work on just one week's worth of data, that that's, you know, that's not enough data. Um, and I know you're doing tremendous contact tracing. So from a, the school's perspective, my assumption would be that if you see a change in the data and it's contact traced in connection with the school, it, with any of our schools or people connected to our schools, then that could that would change the equation. Is that is that a correct assumption? Um, I don't know that it would change how and when you decide whether you would close schools unless it was again a widespread thing. But certainly when we have a cluster within um, a school or a business, which we have had several, it, it tends to be how it happens. You know. Uh, group of people who work closely together or attend church closely together or something, um, live closely together. That's how the clusters happen. Um, we assign a nurse immediately from our team to work with that cluster and everyone associated with it. So it would be, um, you know, the, the manager, the school, and again, it would be a case by case. Um, we hope there'll be some guidance from Desi coming out about what's too many in a classroom when you, you know, or a business, but we don't really, we tend to just kind of work with the case as it happens. It might be isolated to one room or one part of a business. Um, usually clusters don't end up shutting down an entire business, but again, it depends on how much movement those employees have through the business, how many close contacts. It also depends on people's, um, ability to continue operating their coop plans, if you like. Um, and that's something that, you know, we all have to plan for is how, how many people can we have out and still operate? Um, 
So does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers that one. And then relatedly, um, you know, you said that DESE says they're coming out with some metrics, but they haven't yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't know a lot about this. I'm sure you know much more. You know, a nearby district just made the decision to go remote because of a, of a spike in cases. Um, and my understanding from a teacher in that district is they had a metric and this went past their metric for staying open. So in the absence of DESE guidance, um, are, are we, do you know, are you and the administration creating some sort of a, you know, DESE guidance has been very slow. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not confident waiting for that. Um, so I'm just wondering if you and the administration have been working on what our metrics could be um, in the absence of theirs. Um, we can, it, uh, but it probably wouldn't be, um, I don't know that we would set any sort of like hard and fast number. Um, so with public health mitigation, it's sort of these levels, we would define what is low level of transmission, and that's where we are now. And I feel like we have those definitions pretty clear. And then when we would move to moderate or, um, and again, some of the tools that Mass.gov is putting out, those are very useful and they will indicate when our community transmission has moved to the next level. And then we would work, yes, with the school, with the business to say, we're now in moderate level of transmission. So we might want to pull back or we might want to think more about um, restricting some movement or taking some of these mitigation measures that we do in public health. Um, in terms of coming up with our own standards, I, you know, I think um, that's probably something if DESE doesn't step forward, these things do fall into the hands of local. And as you saw last spring, it was kind of this matchbox, like everybody closed all of a sudden and there, I can't remember what, what the state was saying, but I think um, they'll try to allow st different towns to operate. If you don't have transmission, hopefully they'll have a little more flexibility there. Um, it's hard to know how that's going to go because to date, the governor has put out guidance kind of blanketly across the state. So bars can't open, restaurants can now, um, and it's not been dependent on community transmission. So. Um, it would be good if schools had a little bit of that flexibility, but I don't know how the state will rule that out. Um, just to add to that a little bit, in terms of the example you gave, Laura, I think it's actually a helpful example uh, to look at um, because it, it a little, little to add a little more information to that their local health department created a metric, um, but what and and then we you know had to follow through on that metric, of course, as they should. But the challenge was that all of the cases that actually put them over that metric were from a college that kids had just come, come back from other states. So it actually wasn't right. affecting the school community necessarily, but that's sort of the risk of having a single metric. So I, I don't, I'm not qualified to send any metrics. Okay, let's be clear about that. But whether it's, you know, the Department of Public Health or the state, um, I think it does speak to the importance of looking at a variety of a, several to make, to make that, that sort of conclusion. And that's I hope we would do, and that's the, the guidance I'd expect to get from um, from the state. Yeah, I mean, if, if there was any transmission in the schools, we would be working with our epi team at DPH immediately. In fact, we have an epidemiologist assigned to Gloucester just for schools um, in Gloucester. So, um, and they've committed to teams of resource teams to come out and do testing if needed. So we would be working really, really closely with the EPIs at the state, as well as with you guys to say, what is this? Is this part of a you know, widespread transmission throughout our entire school in our community? Is this a, a blip in one classroom where there was an infectious person and, and chances are that's more how it will roll in the beginning? Um, and I think the state will probably have some guidance like they have for other industries and like they did as we both closed and reopened as to when you can do that. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we may not get that kind of clear guidance that we want <clears throat> and we may have to work through it together, which we absolutely will. And, you know, there is, there is a lot of gray in this. Um, and that's, that's what's so tricky for your jobs is having to continually pivot 
Um, and it will change again. I mean, the guidance and the, the things we talk about tonight, uh, research comes out all of the time and that's factored in and, and then we, we pivot again. Um, so I hope there'll be some metrics, but I doubt there'll be any one, you know, metric that's like stay open, close, go hybrid, and nor do I believe there should be. It's too complicated. And like Ben said, um, you don't know if it's a spike in your community because of uh, one particular incident or contained to your nursing home or a particular facility. Um, or whether it's really widespread transmission. If you're not sure, there's steps you take to mitigate until you do know what's going on. So, you know, we've had companies kind of pause for a day or two and close up, see what's going on, work with the contact tracing team, um, and then reopen with appropriate things in place. So there's a lot, yeah. Thank you, that's very interesting. Yeah. M Melissa, <laughs> Melissa, and then uh, I'm sorry, I was going to lower my hand. She just answered my question very thoroughly in that answer. So, okay. um, thank you. Okay. Joel? Thank you. Um, Oops. Karen, can you just, um, uh, there's a lot of people watching tonight. Can you confirm that regardless of where someone is tested, if they test positive, that positive test result gets reported back to your department. So if, for example, there were students in a school who thought they might have it and, you know, were, were tested, you know, in a different city or, or something to that effect to try and, you know, keep from it getting out that so-and-so might have COVID, if there's a positive test result and their residence is in Gloucester, that information comes to your department, correct? If they are a positive test result and they were tested at an official testing site. In the very beginning of COVID, we had a few pop-up labs that were not, a, not certified by the state. And therefore, but we really, I don't think we see any of that anymore. So if you are referred by a physician or primary care for a test in Massachusetts, um, and it, it, that result will come to the Gloucester Health Department. It comes to the health department of where the person resides. Um, we have just learned if someone is away at college, that result will go to the college town to deal with because that's where the person is living for all intents and purposes at the moment, unless they're a day student. But we don't have that situation, you know, where people are coming here, obviously. Um, but if we have college students in, you know, from Gloucester who are in Amherst at school and they are tested positive, that result will go to Amherst to do the contact tracing and it will also be reported in their numbers. I just learned this today. So I think this is kind of a new thing we're just figuring out. Um, but yes, as soon as a result comes in that's positive, it's reported through the MAVEN database um, and that's always same thing with Lyme, same thing with TB. You know, this is not a new system. We've we've have this uh, communicable disease system that is reported to our public health nurse. Um, they're all all of the nurses that work on the database are HIPAA trained. So and no one is no one is given the information. Um, no one is given the names or the information. So if there is an incident that might involve um, a workplace or a school or a group of people, then the contact tracing nurse will work with that um, and I help identify all of the contacts. When you say yes, you get, information, I, you get that information, then it's just not released publicly. So you, you um, get the name. You don't you just get told somebody in Gloucester tested positive. You get told who it is and then it's kept confidential in your department. That is correct. We get an email as soon as there's any activity on MAVEN and we now have a, a, approximately eight nurses and a dental assist, a dental hygienist who have been trained by the state how to use the system and in HIPAA and they review the cases every morning at 845 um, and they assign them and they start their work contact tracing. Thank you. I'm just trying to make sure it gets out that there's no sneaking this past your department. If there's 
you know, an outbreak at a school, regardless of whether people are self-reporting to their teachers or their principals or whatever, you're yeah. not about it. Yeah, I mean, you might get a call saying you've been exposed or been identified as a close contact of someone who tested positive, but you won't be told where and you won't be told who. So it might have happened at school. Um, and if you see a handful of, of people from one classroom all out for 14 days, you can probably piece together it happened in the school setting, but not necessarily. Um, and you won't be told that. You won't be told this happened when you were at your hairdresser or, you know, when you were in math class. It will, it will just, you'll be told that you were identified as a close contact. Yeah. Um, the only way we wouldn't know about it is if it's not confirmed, and we have an awful lot of that. People who maybe have COVID-like symptoms who, or who are getting a test, but the result isn't in yet. Um, people that notice someone's sick and decide to announce and say they have COVID. So we have a, a lot more of that than you, know, you would think you would. But um, so we really try to confirm um, if, if we do hear something that could impact public health, we have to confirm. I mean, we can't just run around and, yeah. Sorry, just a, the last bit on this point. Because all the communities are receiving the same data, so if I am a teacher and I live in Burlington and I test positive, when the Burlington Health Department gets this information, begins the contact tracing, that comes in to either your department directly or to the, the people in the school. Like, how would the students or the colleagues of that Burlington teacher know or be, be informed? So, so the teacher lives in Burlington and works here in Gloucester, say? In this Is hypothetical, that yes. And I hope yeah. there's no teacher, I, if there's a teacher out there who lives in Burlington, I'm not talking about you. I'm making this all up. I want to <laughs> um, again, the result only goes to the public health nurse in the town in which they reside. So we would not know about it unless it involved a workplace exposure. Then the Burlington Public Health Department will reach out to our team and say, you know, we have a handful of people involved in a cluster, close contacts. Some of them are your residents and some of them are my, our residents. And we have had clusters that cross multiple towns and multiple states. And it's a whole lot of work. But we work with um, the airports, the airlines, the state. They will take over any time there's interstate. They will take over that piece. But yeah, I mean, that happens. And the public health nurses connect um, and try to share only relevant information and figure out who's going to do you know, what contacts live in each community and then do the tracing from there. And, and just to add to that, well, we, well, we will be distributing prior to school starting to staff and also to families is what to do if you have a positive COVID test and who to inform the school nurse always, okay? Um, uh, and so, so that's another way we will know and, and we're gonna really trust and have faith and, and I you know, expect this to be you know, fully fine for folks to really follow up with that. Um, and that helps us. So even if in the case your your uh, example you're using, Mr. Havaza, that's what we would expect from our staff is to tell the, the school nurse. Um, and the school nurses are confidential. They're you know HIPAA trained and they understand the confidentiality around that. But that allows us to then um, protect and inform both the health department here, but also then engage in any contact tracing um, as necessary or identification of close contacts. Um. Karen, uh, you touched on this earlier uh, slightly, um, but um, the governor announced, um, I think last week, that he had created a team of uh, sort of a rapid response testing team that could be sent out to schools or, or clusters. Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit so people know that although we don't have testing readily available in Gloucester, um, there are, it, should we have any kind of outbreak, there would be uh, that option. Sure. I, I don't know much more about the program, only what I heard announced, um, and that is that if you have a cluster, which is more than one person in a, a group, of either an employee or a school, um, the state will send out a team to, to do the testing of that entire, either the cluster or the class or who's ever affected. 
but I don't know the details. I don't know how many you have to have before they'll send out, you know, how many contacts, close contacts, before they'll send out the team, um, how we go about exactly like accessing the team. But I imagine there'll be a lot more details to come on that in the next week or so. Uh, but yeah, that is what the state has offered. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Kathy. Um, Karen, I was wondering what your position, what what the um, protocol should be if, you know, say there's, I mean, we know su certain students have asthma, right? And we're in the beginning, I think, of, you know, some kids having some impact from whatever's going on in the environment for coughing. And if we already know that a child has that kind of a condition, so they have a cough, right? Should they also be staying home, given that we already know that they're prone to asthma? And so that would be a normal existence for that child. Um, and if so, you know, what other impacts does that have either for a sibling uh, who's not showing any problems? Um, you know, because I know there's certain kids who come to school and they have nebulizers that the nurse keeps and, and all that. So I'm just curious what, um, how, how vigilant we, we should be, even if we know of a, a, a particular situation that's, already, that's been pre-existing for a long time. Um, I think that the guidance says with the, there's a couple of those minor symptoms that are very common that you need to have like two or two of them together. So I will send you the symptom guidance. I can't remember off the top of my head if coughing is one. Um, so certainly that would all get factored in when the physician is sort of talking to the patient or that when, if, if symptoms do occur. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that person would have to talk to their, their physician. Um, and in terms of school policies around that, I, I'm not really familiar. I, I think that um, probably, I don't know, I can check for you. I can check if Desi has made any sort of policies about if you have these things already. Um, but many of the symptoms are kind of pedestrian and it's a fever and it's a, you know, it's sore throat. It's things that could be other things. So it is a challenge and I think probably it's something, you know, the families can talk with their um, physicians individually about, um, and I can get back to you on that, like the, the actual symptoms. Um, well, one thing we will be uh, also uh, getting out to staff and families is a, it's a pretty easy chart to read that has a comparison of different, um, I guess, ailments and their symptoms. So COVID, cold, flu, seasonal, seasonal allergies, and right. So it's easy to sort of cross-reference, I got this symptom and this symptom, you know, and, and so that's just one piece to help help families do an initial check. Um, of course, then obviously then the guidance is to contact uh, your, you know, your healthcare practitioner um, or even school. Yeah. I think there is a line somewhere in the symptom stuff that is, refers to if it's not your normal baseline. So, you know, a lot of people have a, a scratchy throat as their normal baseline. So, um, but I'll, I'll send that over to you guys and you can look at it. Yep. Okay. So the second thing um, I was asked to cover is face coverings, a um, little more specific about the whole face covering issue. So I'll move on to that. Um, DESI does not specify in its reopening guidelines uh, anything about the type. It sort of says who and the spirit of it. Um, DPH, however, does, and they have a new mask up mask campaign that they're really pushing. Um, and in, that's on the mask.gov website, and it goes over the types of um, masks and face coverings that are advised with a lot of detail. But the basic position of DPH at this point is that anything is better than nothing. And I know that there's been some studies that have challenged this to say that if a, if a face covering um, gets wet, it acts as a conductor. I mean, I have heard these things. 
um, at this point. And then we also heard there was a study that came out last week that set up in a lab and, and really studied all of the different face coverings and ranked them. And there, they came up with the conclusion that um, any face covering does offer some protection. So this is one of those areas that the research is changing all the time. We will know more as we go. Um, but at this point, DPH's take on it is that any face covering, including a bandana, a scarf, a gaiter, is better than nothing. Uh, and I think, especially if you think in your high school setting, they were thinking about um, high school kids who may really not want to, to do this, to wear the face covering, but they would do a gaiter. Um, again, their feeling is something is better than nothing. Um, and I think it also leads to a sort of social norming of wearing something over your face, even if it's not as effective as something else. I mean, the gold standard clearly, and it's spelled out on mass.gov, is multiple layers of fabric. Um, it needs to be able, I came in on the tail end of the mayor saying this, um, she's absolutely right, needs to be able to be washed and dried every day. Um, it needs to fit fairly securely, and it should have multiple layers of fabric. Um, it, in the absence of that, um, people, you know, anything is, according to DPH at this point, they are continuing to say it's better to have someone, a kid put on a gaiter or a bandana that might be thin. It will at least prevent some moisture particles from crossing from one person to another. Um, in terms of the age, uh, again, not under two, no, that's not appropriate for any um, one under two. Age two to five, the guidance is that it's up to the parent to decide. Um, and it should also be coupled with the child's ability to understand how to use the mask um, and to be able to put it on and off themselves safely. Um, they need to know how to not touch it and contaminate it. Um, and that's, you know, so that's very young and that's something that I think um, your staff and parents will have to decide um, what that means. But basically the, the recommendation is that you can encourage and it's good to encourage and start teaching those younger kids how to wear a face covering um, but that it's not, um, you know, they have to have those other things in place as well. They have to be able to breathe safely and feel that they can breathe and they have to know how to handle that mask and be able to get it on and off. Um, so again, you know, I recommend following the, these DPH guidelines um, and as more information comes in, they will update the guidelines and then, you know, we go from there. But um, those of you who've been, you know, part of this from when we first started in March, the guidelines change continuously. And DPH is sort of combing through and has a lot more staff and ability to comb through all this research than we do. Um, any questions on face coverings? Did I answer most of that? Okay. Melissa? I have a question about the... Um the N95 mask. So I did a little bit of research before this meeting tonight because I was trying to find a list of recommended masks. And everything I read about the um, N95 mask is that they should be safe for healthcare workers, not used for the general public. Um, I'm looking at mask.gov right now because that was one website I didn't go on and it, it's saying that they should be safe for healthcare workers. And you look at the CDC website and the FDA website, they also say the same thing. So there's a request to the administration that high needs students and staff we must should have N95 masks. And I'm curious what your um, opinion is on that. I mean, I, I have a lot of nurse friends and I know they get upset because there's a shortage of those types of masks and they don't like, they like those safe for hospitals. So I'm curious to know from your experience and your knowledge, um, is this necessary for high needs students? I mean, is there a difference that we would put those type of masks on staff as opposed to the surgical mask, um, or is it appropriate? I just wanted to hear from a health official 
such as you? What what yeah, your I'm, opinion is on that? Yeah, um, we would we would absolutely agree with the DPH and CDC that those should be reserved for healthcare workers. There, they are um, going to be difficult. They're already difficult to obtain um, in for healthcare workers and in healthcare settings. So it is really important that we preserve those for the environments that really need it, nursing homes and hospitals, basically, where people are actively infectious. So that's the idea of the N95 is the only mask that blocks both air and moisture. So all these other face coverings that we're wearing are really moisture droplets only. Um, but we know COVID can move through the air. And if someone is highly infectious, it's really important that our healthcare workers have an N95 on because it's really their only protection. Um, I think there, if a, if a staff of any facility was working with an infectious person, then maybe there should be an N95 on hand for that nurse. But um, I, d I don't even know that. I think you'd have to really think that one through because um, you don't really know if a child's infectious. And once you do, they're home and they're, they're out of the building away from everyone else. So I don't really see a time in which it would be appropriate or advised for school staff to have N95s. That's not to say that you might not want to do a shield or a little more protection for those employees who are working really closely to younger children or children that might, you know, be spraying droplets or whatever if they're really in close proximity. So those are maybe other precautions that would be um, worth asking DESI about too if they have guidelines for teachers and nurses in settings, in school settings where the exposure is not a hospital um, you know, level exposure, but where there are some additional risks. Um, and certainly for the staff who might be cleaning up after a patient, after a, someone was sick. So those things, and I believe DPH has, uh, DPW has all of those things in place with their team. Um, so the N95s, I mean, the other thing about the N95s, they need to be fitted. You don't just go and get an N95. You have to go to someone who can fit test them to your face to make sure they fit properly and they're working correctly. So it's not a simple thing, um, and it's part of an extensive PPE that should be in place for medical professionals. Thank you. And just to be clear, I wasn't including our school nurses in that conversation. I mean, I think a nurse is the medical profession in the school. Um, but thank you for that. It's very helpful information. Samantha? So uh, just back to the washing of masks on a daily basis. So some families might not have access to um, a washing machine and a dryer on a daily basis. So can, you know, can a sink in some soap work with air dry or I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think like what if families and I would think that there's mm -hmm. some in our district that don't have access to um, a washer and dryer if they go to the laundry mat um, or use somebody else's for example what would you suggest yeah I mean I think the school should have a supply for families that forget or can't provide a mask a clean mask regulate face covering I think washing it is better than nothing. Um, drying, you know, again, early on, high heat was really important, more important than the washing. Um, I think now it, we, we know that it doesn't tend to live on surfaces and um, objects quite like we were worried in the beginning. So, yeah, I think that that would be probably fine to wash the mask well and put it in the sun um, to dry it's better than a dirty mask um, if, that's the, if that's all that's available. So Ben, back to like our needs assessment, um, community needs assessment, it might, I don't know what your thoughts are about seeing if, asking families if they have access to a washer and dryer. A couple of things, um, I mean, uh, thank you, Samantha, that's a, that's a very good point to make. Um, we, we do have thousands of masks already in stock, child size masks uh, that can be used if folks need one. And then also um, if Ms. Clancy could tell us about um, an effort a local community group has made to 
to actually to make many, many masks that we're now that we're going to be distributing um, across our schools. Uh, Kathy, if you want to add to that. Sure. Um, the organization we're in this together, Gloucester, has had numerous mask makers make varying sizes of children's masks, probably for our younger students. Um, I think they probably have close to a thousand that they will have, uh, that they will give to our elementary schools for students that either show up without one, um, something gets dirty, an educator may know that the family may not have access to having, you know, like you say, a washer and dryer. So maybe that family needs extra supply in between. Um, so we're hoping that they get distributed to families that need them and they, they will. Um, and, you know, any kid could forget their mask or, you know, drop it and in the mud. So they'll be there for every family that may possibly need it. So, um, you know, a thousand masks would be at least one for every child if every child needed one. Um, I would guess that a lot of families wouldn't need that particular um, thing unless, you know, unless something happened with the child's mask at school. So, um, so that's, you know, another way our community is helping our kids get back to school in person in a safe way. And, and just thank you, um, Kathy, and add, oh, and add to that is, um, just like our, our staff, our teachers, our school-based staff um, are always looking out for students who may be in need or extra need or extra support on a variety of levels, um, I think it also makes sense at the school level for those folks to also be conscious and aware of students either may need masks or may need a clean mask. And that's something I think we can ask them to look out for as well. Uh, so I'll keep going. Um, the fourth question I was asked was about the three feet, six feet. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to just take a step back to where that came from. And it, it was something that came forward from the initial DESE guidelines. I'm sure you, you all know this and have read them and seen them. And it was based on level of risk. So the studies at the time that um, the group that put those guidelines together were operating from um, showed that children largely were a lower risk group for both getting COVID and transmitting COVID. So the guidelines were a little more relaxed than they were for our adult community. And this isn't unusual again to COVID. And I think maybe a couple examples just to help you know. Um, and then as research changes, <clears throat> these things will probably, you know, they may get tweaked as well. Um, but for example, with our travel requirements, um, if you're traveling in from Vermont, you are deemed to be a lower risk, you don't need to quarantine. If you're coming from Rhode Island or other states that are, have more, tr more transmission, then you do need to quarantine or have a test. And then yet another level of risk, if you have a known exposure to an index case, then you have to quarantine with or without a test for 14 days. So there are all of these anomalies in a lot of the guidance, and I don't think it's totally unusual. And that just kind of hopefully helps you understand where it came from. It was based on an initial assessment that children are less risky population than adults, um, and therefore, they can be closer together. They are not going to spread it in the way in which adults will. Now, again, it's early in the process. And that's where the thinking came. There's still a lot we don't know and schools were largely shut last year. So, you know, we'll know more as we go, but that's the basis for that um, allowing three feet for children um, where six feet is the recommended guidance for other folks. The six feet is also for adults when you can't, so when you can't, when you don't have a mask on or you can't sort of keep apart, you do one of those two things. So where we're largely having people social distance and wear their face coverings in the school, then, then you have that added protection as well. Um, we were also really encouraged by the summer with similar environments with daycares and camps where a lot of young children were coming together for large periods of the day. And um, 
in this area and pretty much statewide, we didn't really have any clusters. Certainly in Gloucester, we didn't. I know I spoke with the Peabody um, Health Director this morning. They did not have any clusters in childcare settings. So we're encouraged that um, even after bringing a lot of young children together this summer, doing the best young kids can do with face masks, we did not see a lot of transmission there. Um, so again, that's where that's based on um, the DESE guidelines and the DPH guidelines, they're kind of one and the same, are for six feet when you can, um, but three feet is, is okay if you can't. So you're working towards that. I mean, the other thing I would say is that, again, in this level of community transmission, which is very low, that those recommendations are, you know, a good starting point. As it, transmission increases and we move to moderate or to substantial uncontrolled or controlled, then we'll be looking at pulling back on a lot of things, such as the social distancing, um, maybe the capacity in a room, um, like we've done with businesses. You know, we'll look at this sort of gradual mitigating steps versus all, all or nothing, shut, lights on, lights off, lights off. So we'll, we'll be restricting movement further. Um, and, you know, as we saw last spring, and then eventually had to go to a shelter in place. But hopefully our community won't, transmission won't get to that level again. But those, you know, it's kind of this gradual thing in which you may re-decide some of these things as we go in conjunction with us. Laura? Thanks. I just wanted to ask you, so thank you for that. I did not ask that question, but um, it's very useful information, but I didn't ask it. Um, just one bit of clarification, because this the, the evidence and the knowledge just keeps, we keep learning more and more, and there's just constantly studies happening all over the world, and, you know, we're, you know, we're just, we're just in the middle of it, right? We're right in this big social experiment. Um, and so these um, guidelines having been created at a moment where people were thinking kids didn't get it. Now we know kids do get it, right? We know that. We, we don't understand, you know, just today I read the last two weeks in Florida, the number of school kids with, the case, with COVID have gone up, you know, a huge percentage. Um, and they're not even really tracking publicly the, the numbers from what I can understand. So it's just like, I, I understand that, you know, states and, you know, major departments of public health have to work, you know, in a very, you know, it, I don't want to say slow, but in a, in a, in a very detail oriented, data oriented way, looking step by step. Um, but when the data changes or when there's more questions about the data, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I guess my question is like, how do we move quickly? I'll give you an example. Um, parents, it may be that the schools didn't close immediately, but I will tell you that parents pulled their kids right out of the schools before they closed in March. And then the schools closed in Gloucester, and then the state was about a week behind, if I'm correct on that. Um, so I guess, you know, these things can change rather quickly, and I understand that a Department of Public Health can't work like that. That doesn't make sense. But if we know that the data has changed, right, how do we adjust to reflect that even if these major institutions have not yet? Great question, Laura. Um, I think just to clarify, back at the time when the guidelines were created, it's not that we didn't think children could get it. We always knew they got it. We just didn't know the extent to which they got sick or they were transmitters. And that research is still kind of shifting. So we know we know they can be carriers, um, usually asymptomatic. We know they can become symptomatic. Um, and I think we what we don't know is the extent to which are they better or worse transmitters than adults. The thinking is that they are not. And most of the studies that went into the DESE guidelines suggested that they do not transmit or get sick to the level that adults do. So, um, you know, I don't, in terms of the research, yes, it is changing rapidly. And I think, um, 
you know, if, if there is, I think we all have to be really careful though, not to react and jump because, you know, things we do, we are learning things. Um, and there's, there's downsides to it. You kind of have to balance it all out. It's a bit like the vaccine. Like we all want it and we want it fast but we also want it to work and be safe and to know that it works. Um, so it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think I mean, we're on twice a week calls with DPH. I don't, we don't talk to Desi as much and I don't know if you guys do, but they have a representative on our call and there is not a piece of evidence a study or CDC recommendation because those are changing too for some kind of strange reasons. And those changes get discussed every call. They are very aware of um, research that's come out, the whole Gator debate, you know, the DPH is very aware of these conflicting pieces of research that are starting to come out, but they are very cautious to go with the best um, studies they have available at the moment. And our health department can't, we don't have epidemiologists on staff. Um, we have a tremendous board who, um, with scientists and, and professionals, and they scrutinize the literature and they read it, they're reading articles a lot as well. So we start, if we start to see something in the literature that's, that's quite different or suggesting that, um, no, the virus doesn't live on a can of vegetables for three or four weeks, we, we adjust our messaging and we're kind of asking the state about that. Um, but the research is slow to come in. I, I understand that, but we, we're reluctant to try to recreate the machinery that they have at the Department of Public Health because they also have access to the entire state's data, hospitalization. So they're seeing and they're reporting. If you look on mass.gov, you know, children are getting it. There are cases by younger age groups, but there are no deaths and no very few hospitalizations. So you can really see what is happening with in Massachusetts, um, pretty real time. I mean, they're updating that data um, once a week. So there's an awful lot of raw data that's um, available to us. And now by town on mass.gov, once a week, they update the town portal as well. Um, that's kind of, you know, being consistent with where their guidance is at the moment. But yeah, I mean, there is not as much research as any of us would like, and there's nothing surer than, you know, what we think we know now will be different in six months. Um, but it's a real challenge. I agree with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, I, I, do you have any more um, Karen, or, or is I think I've covered the key things that I was asked, but um, let me know if there's other things. And... Well, I'm not seeing anybody raising their hands, or, or um, and we have a, a lot more of update to. We're going to talk about sports, and uh, we're going to Great. talk about a um, a uh, policy that we got to put in place uh, for the opening of school about face masks. And uh, we have a few. Great. Other things, so. Well, thank you all for all of your thoughtful work you're doing for our kids. And I really appreciate it. And Ben knows where to find me if you have additional questions. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Okay. Bye, Ben. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, Ben. Great. So I just, I do want to, uh, Karen's off now, but I do want to thank her, acknowledge her again for her support, her ongoing, I mean, uh, uh, efforts to help us understand what to do and how to do it. Um, she and her department just have been a, a huge, uh, um, um, a tremendous asset to the schools, definitely, but also really the community. And also to really also appreciate all the work that our school nurses have done to support the Gloucester Department of Health this summer and working with her and her team, they've become very well trained in understanding COVID, understanding the dynamics of it, understanding contact tracing. So um, because of their work with Karen, uh, our school nurses are, are really in very well poised to support our schools and our community going forward. So, but she just has been great. So I wanna make sure to acknowledge that. 
Let me continue with, with our update because um, there are a lot of, uh, we are really um, gaining momentum here and want to give you an update on a number of areas. So um, we're opening school on September 16th, as everyone knows, that is, it's hard for me to believe I'm saying this, but that is only a week away, which is fantastic news for all of us. Um, and still a lot to do. So I'll give you an update on these areas. Um, and then we'll also dive more deeply into uh, uh, Gloucester High, High School Athletics, and then also obviously the face coverings and mask policy later too as well. So let me jump right in. Um, so opening school, uh, we continue all our teachers and staff continue um, their work in schools to get uh, things ready. Um, we are planning on beginning uh, on Wednesday in person for preschool, um, in person hybrid for K to five, that's five four hour days in person and then finishing remotely each day. At O'Malley, it's their full in hybrid, which is a four hour and 35 minute day in person. And again, finishing the days remotely. Uh, one full day, Wednesdays will be remote. Um, and then GHS, as you all know, starting with remote, um, which also has, you know, fully remote, but also have cohorts of students who are learning in person, high needs students, students who are involved in the career of Oak Tech um, uh, education, um, a career of Oak Tech school in terms of, um, because that type of work really benefits from any person and they've got small, small cohorts. And they'll also be doing in-person orientation for all students by grade level between the 16th and October 13th. So as they gear up for their hybrid. And then also, which I'll give you an update tonight on is the pre-K to 12 remote academy. Uh, so stu the students at all levels who've opted in to learn fully remotely. So um, that's all, that's what we're expecting and planning and preparing for um, uh, next Wednesday those approaches. And um, just again, um, our schools and teachers are, are, have been in since last Monday, uh, doing a tremendous amount of work uh, and preparing and training and working with each other. So uh, just a few things that have been happening in our schools, around our schools. Um, kindergarten screening has been going on and, uh, last week and this week. So that's working with kindergartners to understand about any needs they may have and placement. Um, and also meeting with uh, uh, parents of kindergarten, parents and guardians of kindergartners. Um, th those have been happening in person in our, in our schools. Um, and, have been, uh, and, and actually Mr. Favaza talked about, um, you know, uh, his, his experience there. Um, and typically what happens there is kindergartners go off and meet with staff and have um, sort of some screening exercises, some learning exercises they do. At the same time, um, uh, then parents or guardians um, meet together. And those meetings have been happening in gymnasiums or outside. Um, one was ha one re happened remotely last Sunday night, but uh, we've been getting great responses and a lot of positivity from the ability for those students and their family members to be in the schools. Um, there'll be in-person in orientations for K to five um, starting this Friday. So each grade level will have a chance to come into the schools for a couple of hours across all of our schools, all of our elementary schools. O'Malley will have an in-school building orientation on Monday and Tuesday. Um, I believe Monday it's for eighth and seventh graders and Tuesday it's for sixth graders. Um, the GHS uh, the deans and principal Cook will be recording orientation videos for students covering a lot of um, just how, um, high, uh, how remote learning will be happening. Um, rather than doing that in person, they'll be uh, giving, uh, providing those videos uh, virtually. Um, and then we're working on a lot of details, things that are often completed the, at this time. But as you know, as everyone knows, we've been working on so many levels uh, in so many different ways that these are things that um, families and teachers um, and our staff and our leaders are typically have in, put in place already, but, thing, but now are still being finalized. And that's difficult for folks. It's challenging for folks. Um, but we're just asking for people to be patient with this. And that staff scheduling is being completed homeroom assignments, house assignments at the middle, middle school, class lists, student schedules are being finalized, um, bus stops and bus routes are being finalized. Again, these are the types of things that at this point, schools and especially families, all, they all know about. Um, and that's been difficult to do because we, are, you know, we had to, because we're rethinking of school in a whole new way than we've ever, ever done before. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier tonight, our health and safety protocols, they're finalized. We're just putting them in formats and communication um, in a way they can be easily used and easily followed by families and staff. Um, so those things are all happening um, at pace as quickly as possible. Um, we'll have a bunch of upcoming family communications. Schools are communicating with families and have been, um, but we also need to do some district-wide district communications. 
And these are a few of them. Um, health and safety, as I mentioned, transportation and bus stops, those are still being finalized as we're finding, identifying more students who um, you know, need uh, pickups, that sort of thing, or are eligible for pickups. Food services, we'll be com communicating about our grab and go uh, breakfast and lunch. Um, update on providing free meals, which we, we at this point, the federal government has said we'll be able to provide free meals um, uh, through uh, to December 31st, but we'll have an ordering system up and running. And so we'll be communicating the next couple of days about that. Um, we'll be providing after school programming update as that, as that gets finalized for K to five families. Um, we will be, I'll mention, I'll talk more about Remote Learning Academy in just a moment, but we'll be communicating from the district and also from the Remote Learning Academy teachers in the coming days. Um, and then ongoing communication from principals and are also updating our Back Together GPS website, providing updates via Facebook. So um, again, I would say, you know, we're not, we're, we, need, we need to um, do this rapidly. We're a little, a little behind on this. And part of that is some of those pieces that are still being put in place. And so it's, it's difficult for our families. Folks have, have reached out to us as um, um, the, um, the mother did uh, during open communications. Um, we understand this is challenging and we were getting that communication out um, this week. We'll get out much of this. Um, so just um, on the Remote Learning Academy development. So this is K to five I'm focusing on first. And then we've got Lynn Beatty here to update us on the six to eight in a moment. So uh, we have now uh, capped enrollment here. Uh, it's been growing, uh, continue to grow this week. We're about to 25, almost 30 students this week alone. Uh, we're at 20% of K to five um, students are enrolled in the Remote Learning Academy. It's 255 students. The grade sizes do range from 37 to 48 students. And that's grown significantly in the past week, especially in a few different grades. Um, at this point, um, the team consists of six classroom teachers, a special education teacher, English language teacher, paraprofessionals. We we're adding a specialist teacher and also adding additional teachers because of the increased enrollment to try to make sure we can keep those class sizes uh, down lower. Also our literacy and math coaches will be supporting teachers and supporting students. Um, and then in terms of administrators, Assistant Superintendent Greg Bach, um, Special Education Patty, uh, Director Patty Wegman, Tammy Morgan, former Principal Tammy Morgan, who's still working with us, and then Christine Castle, our EL um, uh, director and Title I director are all supporting the effort as well. So it's a very much a team approach. We are essentially, as it says up top here, you know, creating a virtual online school from scratch in a matter of weeks. This is um, no uh, small challenge. Um, the communication to families is imminent. Literally, I was reviewing tonight uh, communication to go out from Assistant Superintendent Bach to families tomorrow, and then teachers will be reaching out directly to their students on Friday. So um, again, that's in process, but we are pulling it together quickly. The teacher, the uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Bach reports that the teachers that are working on this are very enthusiastic, challenged, but really working very well together um, to come up with schedules and approaches and just how they're gonna organize it. And just put a fair bit of enthusiasm from that team, certainly. Um, um, and they um, are doing a great job together of coming together on that, so. Um, Melissa, then, um, Melissa, you have a question? Sorry. No, okay, sorry. Uh, then, and then Lynn, if you could um, chime in, then, then I'll pause for, after this, I'll pause for, for folks who can ask questions about remote learning. Um, uh, Principal Beatty, if you could help us, um, I put some numbers up there, but if you could give us an update on how things are going at the six to eight, please. Sure, um, hi everyone, nice to see you. Um, we have, uh, we're, everything's coming together. Uh, we, we yesterday um, stopped making changes between remote and hybrid in the model. Um, most of them were pretty settled. We had about 70 families that initially um, didn't respond. So we made phone calls to make sure that we reached every family and that they got, got the choice that they wanted, provided other information, et cetera. So um, the numbers that, that Ben has there are, I think they're a little higher than that. I think we're about up to about 150 um, in the remote. Um, Special ed percentage is, is pretty much about the same, um, maybe a little bit higher than that. Um, so we have, uh, what we've done, it's a little different at the middle school. What we've done is dedicate three of our, our three half houses, the two person houses to remote learning. So we were fortunate to have a model that set up and allowed us to do that and the numbers uh, worked for us. So, so the sixth grade Harbor team 
the seventh grade Phoenix team and the eighth grade Beach team, although it's not necessarily those, those exact staff members, those teams are, are remote and they'll be working with teachers. Um, we've, uh, I've been sending out some information last, last Friday, I sent out to both remote and hybrid families, uh, a lot of information about um, how Chromebook pickup is going to work, um, the orientations that we're doing for the, the kids who are coming into the building to go over safety and those kinds of things. Um, the schedules, which are exactly the same in the in-person model as they are in the, in the hybrid model as they are in the remote model. Um, and some functional pieces of information. It was a lot of logistics that went out. There'll be more going out. Um, right now we're focused on um, getting ready to distribute Chromebooks on Monday and Tuesday, either at the building orientation for kids who are coming to the hybrid or um, we'll, we're doing a, a pickup um, for those people who are working remotely. Um, and I've offered a no contact pickup for those people who prefer that. So we've been getting information on, on who needs what around the Chromebook pickup and orientation. Um, our teachers have been planning those orientations to make sure that kids are welcomed in. We run them through all of the safety procedures. We, we welcome them back into the building. We recognize that um, for them to be coming back together in school right now is, is different. It's been six months. They don't know what to, to expect. So, um, so we're really excited to have them coming back in. Um, and then uh, the, for all of the families, um, whether they're remote or in the building, information on, on um, accessing schedules through the portal, on logging students in through IDs, um, all of that will be coming over the next couple of days. Um, the big burning question is, is the supply lists and the homeroom lists, and we hope to have those out into, into um, hard copy mail tomorrow. Um, this is the one hard copy mailing that I do in the year to make sure that we've accessed everybody and that um, they know that they need to keep their email addresses up to date with us so that we can do that. Great. So that's a good place to pause and see if there are any questions about either Remote Learning Academy or, or the, how the middle school is going. Melissa? I just, I'm, I'm wondering, and I don't need an answer to this other than just saying it um, for you to think about, are, are we keeping in mind that there could be, and I, and I say could be because I've been browsing social media a lot today, being home, um, and seeing a lot of parents that are choosing remote only because they want to see how it goes because there's such a fear right now of entering school um, with the intention of probably coming back in after the opening of school to see how it goes. So I, I, I guess it's just something to keep in mind that um, while we think that remote might get larger, there's a good chance that it could get smaller by some of the thinking of some parents that I see out there. So I just wanted yeah. to drop that thought, that's all. Yeah, when I, we certainly have that in our minds. Um, at this point, our enrollment in person is pretty full because we've allocated those two person teams to remote. Um, we've, we've set things up so that the next opportunity to come back into the building is the end of first term. Um, so with, with a few weeks notice. So I will check in with families midterm to say, hey, how are you doing? What are you thinking? So that we can prepare if we need to move staff back into the building so that we can house more kids. Cause we, you know, I think at that point in time, we will still be wanting to stick with our 12 or less in a classroom so that we can be six feet apart. Um, so we, we know that there will be some work to do should that come about, but we're, we're very aware of that possibility. Samantha, uh, Laura. Thank you. I actually have a question, Ben, um, from earlier, your earlier slides related to the K through five. Um, uh, just so you know, like not all parents um, were met with during kindergarten screenings. So um, that was not universal across elementary schools. Um, and what it reminded me of is something that you couldn't possibly know about because you weren't here yet. But in the spring, there were real differences among the elementary schools about, especially related to communication with families. Um, and I think it's something that would be very useful to sort of figure out now before we're back, before we're back, um, because those discrepancies lead to a lot of confusion. Um, and it was, it was, 
you know, there was a lot of, um, among parents, there was a lot of like, this is happening here, this is happening here, this is, you know, um, and I think, um, I'm, a, I mean, so I'm seeing that already, like, as a parent, I don't know anything about safety protocols in a school, in my school, um, and I'd like to, um, so, um, so just to have your eye on that, if possible. Sure, yeah. So um, I wasn't here and didn't experience it here. What I can promise you, I experienced it in, in Brookline. Um, and uh, so I'm definitely aware of that. I will say this, and, and I want to say a couple things. First, completely hear the need for communication and, um, and high quality learning to be consistent you know, across and high quality engagement. And, and that means for parents and of course students to be consistent across the district, whatever school we have. I mean, that, that needs, needs to be a baseline, right? Um, and also, there will be differences in folks, how folks communicate. I think you understand that. And I think it is, up, it, and, and you know, how people communicate or exactly what they communicate or their style, that sort of stuff. So and just like there'll be differences um, between teachers, okay? Um, but I think it's really important to, um, one, sure, make sure that the quality is high, um, but also, um, allow for some differences and not, um, and be careful how we as leaders of the district, um, you know, and um, how do I say this? That don't, uh, that we don't highlight those as differences in, you know, in, in quality or judgment or, um, you know, uh, in, in comparison in that way. It, it is not a question about quality. That has to be a real baseline of really high quality real commitment to communication, real commitment to engagement, real commitment to learning. Um, but the, but, the, um, but I, I want to balance that across identifying differences and, 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 and how we assess or judge or communicate those. Um, uh, you are right. I will often speak in, you know, this is what folks are doing and aren't capturing every single um, nuance and variation. Um, and I'll be conscious of that. So I appreciate that quite a bit. And, um, and I also really do appreciate the heads up of, this is something we have to continue to look at. And I agree, agree with you entirely. One thing I will laud our principals with, um, especially our K to five principals, obviously they're the ones who have, you know, multiple schools and one grade level, is their collaboration, their communication. I actually call them copycats today in, in, a, in, a, in a kidding way, because they're very much aligned. They, very, they, make, they work closely together um, so there'll be differences between the schools, school cultures, approaches, that sort of stuff. That's okay. Um, but I've got complete confidence in their collaboration, their collegiality, their making group decisions. It, it just is, I say that not as a response to what you're saying, but to make sure the community, it, it's a, it's a, um, it's an accolade of them. I wouldn't expect, I'd expect very few groups of five principals to be as aligned and as collaborative as they are. It's a real credit to them and a real, and real benefit to this community. Um, and, and, and I hear you fully at the same time. And I, I really appreciate that caution. And I also want to say, I have no question, and I didn't in the spring, about the quality across the district. Yeah, yeah. So that is, I just want to be very clear. I, I do not question the quality at all. I just want to, you know, as, as someone who's come into this new, um, you know, there's no way for you to know. And there are different personalities and everyone is doing, from what I can see, a phenomenal job yeah. getting this together. Yeah. Um, and communication is really important right now. That's all I say. Yes, I thank you very much. Samantha? So Ben, with um, an increase in K through five in remote learning, are, did, have we seen a reduction in some of those higher classes that we were sort of concerned about, those higher enrolled classes, some of our schools? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't have an adjustment on those, uh, you know, from last week. I just don't, I don't. Um, uh, we do, um, uh, you know, at this point, uh, two thirds, um, one second here. I don't. I don't know if we. I just don't know if we've made adjustments on that specifically on specific you know, distances, and I don't think we made any across the board ones. These have been. Um, I think some at Beeman, we did get an uptick of Beeman um, students who um, were identified as being going remote. So there may be some adjustments there, and that was one of our you know schools with a little closer. Um, but I just don't know exactly how, how much of shift there has been. 
in school to school or classroom to classroom. Um, Jonathan, just as a quick follow up, and I don't know if this is uh, the appropriate time, but I just want to put it out there that I would love to hear from the committee at some point um, about what everybody's individual thoughts are in relation to sort of how equitable it is to have, you know, some classes in first grade in some schools have nine kids and some have 20. Um, and what our thoughts are in, are in relation to that. Um, I know I have some concerns about the equity of that, but will there be space at some point for us to sort of discuss that and what that's gonna look like across the district? Sure, we can, we can talk about it. Joel brought this up at the last meeting and, and trying to make it available to um, parents to understand that, uh, you know, you got 20 in your class, but the, the school, down the road is is at nine that you know inter district uh, uh, choice is available um, to um, you know I don't know if you want to go down the path of telling people they got to go to a different school than right. what they, their their catchment area is or where they where they've been going to school so I don't, that's a that's a, a whole different um, can of worms. Um, but we can we can we can have a discussion about that at some point, um, but I think we need to let it play out because there there are things in play. Um, some of the uptick, um, I believe, um, at at Beam and it has to do with transportation as opposed to actually choosing remote or choose. You know, we got some transportation issues that we we are working on and trying to resolve, and and that may shift some of that back. Um, the way it, it, it earlier was. Uh, in other words, people were choosing remote because they um, have difficulty uh, getting their kids to school. You know, it, it's at the two mile limit. Um, you know, you could be a mile and three quarters away and that's sort of a long haul in January for a kindergarten kid, you know? See, there, there's only, there, the only place at this point I mean, so I think this is an important issue to consider and, and, and to raise, uh, to, so thank you, Ms. Watson. And Mr. Pope does also sort of summarize quickly some of the challenges, okay? Um, it may make sense, you know, with veterans being, you know, some very small classes, um, if we get more enrollment at Beeman and, and, and kids live, you know, within proximity of veterans, that we would suggest folks go to veterans instead. That's something to consider. Um, whether moving kids, uh, who are already enrolled, that's a much more complicated aspect that the school community would have to weigh in on. I will say this, just in terms of the, the latest numbers I have on class size is the only classes that may be at 20 or, or at Beeman, and those have been adjusting. Um, so, um, so they're not lots and lots of classes that are 20, but there, is, there are discrepancies of 18 and 17 versus you know, 10, 11, 12, that sort of stuff. Those discrepancies do exist um, in the district right now, just in terms of enrollment. Yeah. So Ben, if if parents are concerned about, about their kids' individual classroom, can they reach out to administration directly about switching schools? Like, how would that work? They, they should talk to their own principal where they go, where they're going to school now and raise it with them and then if, if and talk it through. And then the principals can, you know, work with myself or Greg Bach. Um, we typically do it then. then, then we would work with the other principal. You know, it shouldn't be handled principal principal and we should not have families reaching out to, you know, either me or another principal of where they want to go. They should work with their own principal. Start okay. the, That's start great there. feedback. Thank yep. you. Great. Um, I, if there are no more questions right now, I'll continue to the next. And, and what I'm going I'm I'm to jump ahead to give you an update on uh, the technology and then go back to facilities quickly. This is just one slide. So, um, of course, uh, doing uh, learning the way we have been uh, is a serious demand on technology and we've been acquiring and readying uh, a lot of technology. Um, there's some good news here and some challenging news. So the, the K to five remote academy Chromebooks are at each school right now with lists of who they're going to. They're ready to be distributed. That happened today. Um, as Principal Beattie um, mentioned, O'Malley's Chromebooks will be distributed next week on Monday and Tuesday. Um, GHS, all students have Chromebooks unless they're new, I mean new students to the high school. Um, and then uh, 
here's one of the challenging pieces of information. Um, as you may imagine, um, Chromebooks are, supply of Chromebooks are, um, are just delayed across the country. Um, uh, they're on a high demand, as you might imagine, being the single probably most uh, you know, used tool in during remote learning and dur during the COVID epidemic. Uh, we're doing many better than a lot of schools. We've heard from other districts in Massachusetts that aren't getting Chromebooks till October, November, and December. Right now, our Chromebooks that are for grades three through eight are, um, uh, won't be delivered until uh, September 18th. And I'm wondering uh, if I, that might be three through six. Let me just double check on that. But, but just so you know, some of them will not be here till later in, in September. That means that um, distribution will be difficult until uh, before October because they have to be brought in um, and prepared for students to use. Another challenging piece, but not a make or break, is our Chromebook cases. They're also back ordered across the country and they won't be um, here to, until December. We'll, we'll use sleeves until the cases arrive. Okay, so the, 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 the good news here is that we have the Remote Academy students, so those families who've, who, or those students who are opting into the Remote Academy, K through 12, all are covered, okay? They're the ones who are gonna be you know, needing these the most. Um, as we are in the, um, the hybrid approaches for elementary and for middle, uh, they'll be doing you know, less um, uh, sort of on-demand remote work um, uh, than, uh, 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 um, than they will later if you go fully remote. Um, but we will, uh, when these orders come in, have you know grades three, three through twelve fully um, uh, staff or supplied with Chromebooks, and then we have uh, carts uh, that are available to use in school for um, uh, for the younger youngest grades or distribute when necessary. Um, we won't distribute Chromebooks to take home for the youngest grades until we go fully remote. If we go fully remote, uh, any questions on that? Grant here. Ben, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so my question is, given that we, um, I, and I know, I'll press it, preface it by saying, I know certain Chromebooks are uh, probably beyond their useful life and can't continue. So I think some of the purchases have to do with that normal cycle of the life of a, a heavily used Chromebook. But in the spring, we, we handed out a lot of Chromebooks. And so is this 520 to new families, to replacement because Chromebooks no longer work? Because um, I know we tried to do very, you know, a great job of saying which families have technology at home, which families need Chromebooks. So I'm just trying to understand the hundreds of Chromebooks that that are going out. Sure. Um, let me add, let me just before I get into your question, I want to make one correction. Um, this should say grades three to five will not get the new Chromebooks delivered till um, September 18th. As I mentioned before, Chromebooks at the middle grades will be distributed this next week. So we'll be missing grades three, four, and five only. Um, we are doing a combination of things. Both uh, will be um, communicating about getting back the, the computers that were sent out or distributed in the in the spring and you know summer. Um, those will be refurbished. Um, some of those will have to go offline completely and will be you know of no lo no longer use. Um, some of the ones we're using, especially um, um, at uh, um, six or seven or the earliest grades, K through two are sort of nearing their end of their useful life. So there's a little bit of cycling off um, and a little bit of, uh, we also always have or need to have a percentage um, ready to go because of those that may get damaged or break or just you know die, that sort of thing. So I think we count on um, uh, have about uh, um, uh, 10 or maybe 15% and sort of back up basically. Um, yeah. And if uh, Grant want, or Brandon want to answer that, add to that, they're welcome to. I think Grant's here. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yes, yeah, so, so we do maintain a, a surplus stock for emergency repairs and replacements for loaners. 
while other devices are out for repair under other insurance. Um, as Ben said, that we will be looking at collecting devices for the grades that are already slated to receive devices, especially through grades six and seven, and the kids that were in grades eight as well uh, from last spring. So, it, but it's a it's a sort of a, a, a rearranging of of of, uh, of items and and hardware. How do we get it back in time? How do we turn it around? How do we pre-process it? How do we get it back? Meanwhile, we're still doing the distribution. So, we have a plan. We're doing the best we can. And it's going to be really up to how how well we get, how how, the, how responsive we are of getting these devices back from the community to help seed the lower grades. I think just one one addition to that is um, talking about families having um, needing more than one device often, obviously multiple children. And I think we're I think my understanding is we'll be able to provide better for that for for that this year um, by having you know, every student three through twelve at least have their own device. Um, that is correct. Yeah, so that that'll that'll ease some of the burden of sharing that those folks who had to who were supplying their own may have faced in the in the springtime. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go backwards and just give a facilities update. Uh, give a um, a sort of a short summary of today's meeting um, with DPW uh, for those who can join in. Um, a summary of the work being done and then updates that'll be coming from DPW as well. So just to jump into that. So um, just a quick summary of today's meeting. It's worth listening to, I think. Um, what was clearly said by both the Siemens representative and um, Mike Hale, Director of Department of Public Works, is that the schools are safe to occupy at this time. The air exchange is safe now, and we are taking additional measures to improve air exchange. Um, they both said that uh, pretty clearly. That I think is a quote um, if not uh, the exact words um, uh, from them. Um, the focus is on improving air exchange and airflow. So uh, they're doing an ongoing evaluation of our current systems, which we've been reporting on. Um, they're making improvements based on this evaluation to ensure systems are working as designed. Um, they'll continue to, the, then they balance the systems to optimize and improve airflow, okay? Um, at th that point though, they're also now will be uh, air quality testing in two different times. The air quality, they're going to test the air quality this week. That's going to be done by environmental health and engineering, a firm out of Newton. And um, then they'll also test it again once the systems are all balanced um, uh, appropriately based on the analysis they're doing in their evaluation. Um, and then further enhancing the air quality by adding ionization units as the fall progresses. Um, so those are things, so that's, that was sort of the summary of, of what was reported today. Most of that isn't new to us. We've been reporting this in a, in a variety of ways um, over the past few weeks, every presentation I give, in fact. But just to, to, to sort of dive into some of the detail of the additional pieces here. So again, one of the, the priorities is increasing, increasing fresh air and air exchange. So again, balancing the systems at all seven schools and making sure that they're increasing airflow. That also those efforts will include open windows at our four smaller elementary, Beeman, East Gloucester, Veterans, and Plum Cove. Those are our buildings that, that have windows that can open. Um, and in, in this case, benefit with fresh air um, because they're individual systems within, within each classroom. Um, we'll also be running systems for longer at the end of the day and earlier in the morning to make sure the air floor, fresh air, more fresh air is circling into, an, uh, into the building. Um, that's another step we're taking. Um, we'll be filtering and dis disinfecting the air. As I've reported every week, all filters, air filters were changed in the spring, then change again this summer. Um, and then, as I mentioned just a second ago, we'll go further on disinfecting air by adding the ionization units. Um, and those ionization units are designed to combat airborne, airborne pathogens and viruses. So this is a little more detail than the, the summary I just gave you. Um, not too different from what I reported last week. Um, all the cleaning, or we've been cleaning our ventilation systems. So those four buildings that have ventilation systems, preschool, West Parish, O'Malley and JHS, those are all completed at this point. Those have cleaned and vacuumed the intake events. Uh, we're ensuring the systems are fully operational. That's a lot of the work that Siemens is doing with DPW that I mentioned before. And that's a variety of things, updating controls, uh, making repairs, making sure uh, machines are turned on, replacing AC pumps. So they, through their analysis or their review of all the systems they identified um well they did this in two ways they reported today 
from previous reports, they knew of some things that needed to be remedied or fixed, and they're doing those. And then also from looking at each, each unit, uh, each system, uh, additional identified additional um, upgrades to get each system working as it's designed. Um, and that includes the unit events um, uh, that were identified in prior reports. Um, and then the last piece is um, that DPW is also working on in terms of our uh, facilities installing touchless bathroom fixtures, which they'll be doing um, as we proceed throughout the fall. Um, and the, those, and also really almost all the funding for this is coming from the COVID relief funds from grants available to us through the federal and state government. Um, uh, we're also, we'll be relying on support from the city of Gloucester um, some of the uh, funding that is available to the entire city will be allocated um, to the schools as well uh, to support this work, especially the ventilation um, work as well. Um, and one last piece, we talked about this today at the meeting with Mike Hale and, and DPW. Uh, we should expect instructions for our employees about what to do and what not to do in terms of making sure the air handling systems are functioning properly. Um, and they mentioned a couple today, keeping vents, making sure vents are uncovered, making sure they're not, they're kept on. Um, and also specifically for a Mailey, because there's been some confusion about with that, with that school, they have a, a school-wide, building-wide system for HVAC, but there are also some windows that are open, um, you know, guidance on whether those windows should be open or not, or when or why not, um, to make sure people are clear on just how to actually make sure the um, HVA system HVA system at O'Malley is working as designed and to the best of its ability. So we want to be clearer with our employees about their do's and don'ts in order to help um, ventilation. Uh, we'll be getting data on the air quality testing as it's completed. Uh, uh, I've also asked for a weekly update on what work has has you know been completed during that week and what work is underway, um, including. Um, uh, school committee asked for sort of a, a timeline on these things as well. Um, and then the last piece is, is the cleaning protocols for our daily cleaning, which will be a combination of our DPW custodians and also um, our, the new janitorial services we we're bringing on that are starting next week, and also um, nightly cleaning protocols as well. So those are things we can expect from the DPW. In addition to a uh, tremendous amount of work that you know, their small but very capable team is doing across all our buildings to, um, you know, uh, to maintain their safety and increase the quality of, um, of the air um, and the airflow. Um, and this is just more about the daily nightly cleaning, but um, let me pause there. Um, that's really the facilities update and see if folks want to um, uh, have any questions or want to just highlight some things from earlier um, today at all. Um, Melissa? Um, so our meeting got over at 10 at 1130. Did you get to follow up with anything um, with Mike Hale after the meeting? Because um, I know Siemens was in today and they were doing some testing and I thought I heard them say that there'll be some preliminary results available uh, for the smaller schools on Friday. So have you had any conversations with Mike since that meeting today to find out how things were going? Because I know this week is very active in the schools with Siemens or Simons and the, um, the third party consultant that's coming in. Uh, no, I was not able to other than sending him a thank you. Um, okay. I will. Kathy? Yeah, I, I think um, what needs to be highlighted, and I know we've thanked profusely the efforts of Mike Hale and his department, but I think what also needs to be highlighted to the community is the um, dedication and seriousness that the city side has taken with respect to our buildings to get our students in school. I am um, so grateful, not only for their you know, for their expertise and the work they're doing, but for the financial commitment that has been, um, that is behind it. Uh, I know there are some grants, but it doesn't all come from grants. And um, I think it says a lot to how much we care and value our, our students' education. 
Thank you, Kathy. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, may, and I, I may not say it enough, but it is uh, tremendous leadership from the mayor and from the city side. And also, as you said, folks willing to step up to help us out um, on so many different ways, both effort and work and human resource, human time, but also um, funding as well and, and, and flexibility. So um, thank you very much for pointing it out. Um, so moving on. questions, uh, we're gonna jump into, um, one second here, where did it go? Here we go. Uh, I think we're gonna jump into, um, wait a minute. Do you see the presentation or not? You, okay, all right, great, hold on. Did that. And so we're gonna jump into fall athletics. And so um, Athletic Director Brian Lafada and Principal James Cook will have an update. I will run the slides and they will do the, the explanation and storytelling. Ready to go? Excellent. We're not seeing anything new though about fall athletics on the screen. It just still says in school safety precautions. Oh, so it's not, it's not, okay, hold on. Thank you. How about now? All right. Um, that's not what I want to talk about. So James or Brian, you want to jump in from here? Yep, definitely. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, thank you, everybody, for giving me an opportunity tonight to uh, discuss a couple important topics. Um, first one is a, a positive one, uh, some good news for us. Uh, I have some slides here that we'll quickly go through. As everyone knows, we had our uh, field house project. Uh, that first slide that Ben had just a second ago was uh, obviously our original. Uh, on May 11th, I took that picture of our old field house. You can see the old orange street cones nailed to the floor. Uh, the holes in the bleachers and all the fun stuff that we've dealt with for many years. Um, next slide we go to um, is June 19th and they've ripped everything out, bleachers, all the subflooring, um, basketball court, track, everything at that point. Uh, the next picture will show uh, about uh, another month later when they're starting to work on all the various subflooring they're putting in, bringing in the new basketball court, uh, preparing obviously to lay the track down. Uh, the next photo from there, uh, July 27th, uh, same thing, they more or less put it, uh, the multiple layers of subflooring down and you can see on the main basketball court starting to lay the hardwood down. Um, and then uh, about another two weeks later, now we're starting to get the exciting part, putting the new track in, um, all the Mondo flooring that they do that covers both the two end basketball courts we have, uh, as well as obviously the track. Um, so that's quite a process, a lot of rolls of uh, the Mondo material. Uh, the next slide, uh, September 3rd, just recently, is then all of the um, Mondo material down. Uh, the basketball court is down. They've put a couple uh, layers on, but still need to line it. Uh, you can see the new bleachers uh, had been put into place. It was actually very impressive how quickly a project uh, they fly through that to install and put all the bleachers in. So you can see that far one with our new GHS logos. Uh, on the bleachers. Um, next one, and this one would be today. Uh, another exciting part is, is having the lines finally put down for the track. Um, the lines being done obviously for that will take a couple of days. Uh, they will, and actually into the next picture will show um, on the main court, uh, they're taping out all the various courts between uh, the side basketball courts, the main basketball court, uh, volleyball courts that we use for intramurals, uh, they're doing that and tomorrow. They'll start officially painting all those various lines and then the coming weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they'll start doing the, the logo on there. We've got scoreboards getting replaced. Uh, they've had inspections for all the basketball hoops, especially some of the ones that were either stuck up or stuck down the last few years. Um, so all of that will be taking place and uh, it's exciting. And to be honest, now that the teachers have been back in the building uh, and more of the coaches have been around, uh, just the smile on their face to see this project, which obviously, uh, thank you to the school committee, the city council, mayor, um, the DPW, all the work they've done. It's, it's been great. And so I can't wait to see the final project. And I know a lot of the student athletes, they're going to be ecstatic when we get them back in and starting to use this. So it's going very well, but I did want to, uh, Ben wanted to make sure we gave a good update on this, let you guys kind of know where it's at. And uh, so that's there, where we are with that. And I'll keep you posted as uh, we wrap it up the next few weeks. Uh, the bigger topic tonight that we obviously want to discuss 
<clears throat> excuse me, I gave a update briefly a couple weeks ago. Uh, but my plan tonight is I'll just give you kind of an overview over the past few weeks what's happened, uh, the opportunities that we may have for our student athletes in the 2020-21, uh, the, the full year, um, but more importantly, the fall or what you'll find out a fall two uh, season we'll talk about. So it did start a few weeks ago, August 19th, when the MIAA, our governing body uh, for all of Massachusetts sports, created a four-season opportunity for this school year. Uh, typically, as most of you are aware, we have three seasons, fall, winter, and spring sports. But uh, what they did, as I, I have listed here, they have a fall one that the MIAA is offering to, uh, to take place September 18th to November 20th. There is one stipulation at this point with that, that there is no MIAA postseason or state tournament for any of those sports. Uh, the winter season, which is your typical basketball, hockey gymnastics, wrestling, swim and dive, all the indoor sports basically from November 30th to the uh, February 21st. Uh, the new addition is the fall two floating season. Uh, that is February 22nd to April 25th. And then the fourth season is our usual spring season, obviously outdoors with our outdoor track, tennis, baseball, lacrosse, softball. Uh, and that is pushed back to start date to just after April vacation and will run later to July 3rd. Uh, as I noted there with these seasons, one question people have is overlap. Uh, they have set this up so there will be no overlap um, between each season. So kids will not have any issues of wrapping up one seasoning and trying to start a second one. Uh, some of the notable guidelines that they put in place uh, with these seasons. Uh, number one is the higher risk fall sports automatically would be moved to the fall two floating season. Uh, the football and competitive cheer are both considered high-risk sports still at this point. So they are, no matter what, they are moving to um, February 22nd to April 25th, and that is statewide. So no schools have the opportunity to move that. The lower and moderate-risk sports, uh, lower obviously being golf and cross-country, moderate being field hockey, boys and girls soccer, uh, cross-country obviously is girls and boys as well. Uh, those lower and moderate risk sports do have the opportunity to play in the fall one season, which as I said, starts as early as September 18th, but could start later depending on um, decisions and everything, um, or they could move those to fall two. Schools that are in the red on the average daily incidence map, which obviously comes out every Wednesday and we saw the most recent numbers, um, any school or any school that's in a city that is red uh, is automatically moves all of their sports to the fall two season starting in February. So that right there is your golf cross country, as I said, soccer and field hockey now would not play this fall, but definitely would have to start or have the opportunity to play a season in February. Uh, next slide, Ben. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, a statement from the MIAA when they um, going through this entire COVID-19 situation is uh, if a yellow, green, or unshaded district that is only offering remote learning to its high school students wishes to participate in the regularly scheduled sports season, this must be approved by the local school committee. Obviously, that's one of the main reasons why we're here tonight with uh, Gloucester High School being remote and quite a few of the schools in our conference. Uh, this is a decision that they want the school committee to be in charge of and, and, and understandably. Um, so, as I said, that was more around the August 19th. Less than a week later, we did have um, a meeting with the NEC principals and the athletic directors. Uh, many people did hear about this. Uh, the principals do have a, a vote, um, and they voted to move all fall sports at that time to the fall two season starting in February. The vote was nine schools voted yes to move it, zero no's, and three abstains. And as we had mentioned, and Mr. Cook was very involved with this, um, uh, we did abstain from our vote in that league vote on that day on the, the 24th. Uh, we felt uh, we did not have enough time, obviously, to communicate with Superintendent Lummis, the school committee. Uh, we felt like it was a little bit fast on a vote. We thought there was more time and more information we would need. Um, so that's why Gloucester did have an abstain vote at that time. In general, to give you an idea about the conference, the general thought was that the, the, the conference would stick together as a league or a conference uh, so they could all play in the fall two season, um, where at that time of the vote, the last bullet point there, five of the 12 schools in our conference were actually in the red according to the state map. So those five schools would not be able to play in this immediate fall one. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Ben. 
Thank you. Um, two days after that vote, uh, the, the new map did come out, the new uh, statistics, and two of those five schools that were in the red were then dropped out of it or out of the red classification. So then at that point, making nine of the 12 schools eligible to play fall one starting in as early as September 18th. Um, since that time, that August 24th vote, there's been many discussions held at various levels of administration and, and through city officials and everything. Uh, and it was decided to reevaluate the situation. Um, and many people may see through the media. Uh, many of the other school committees are going through this. Last night, there was a couple of the high schools um, last week, there was some to two or three tonight having meetings. So um, it is on everybody's radar right now as a top product, um, top item. What I've done, just so you guys have, a, so, so the committee, you have a, a better idea of what the kids have as an opportunity before um, any, hopefully can answer some questions for you, but also give you more information when coming up with any decisions that you may want to make. Um, fall one, the season, which would be uh, September 18th to, um, I, I believe again, off of no November 22nd was the date. The pros for that would be uh, playing during the regular time of year that fall sports would, would happen. Our kids are used to being obviously at this point of season, the season, they would already be playing games on the state right now. They would have been practicing and playing games for the past three to four weeks, uh, excuse me, three weeks or so. Um, it would be just nice to try and create some normalcy for the student athletes to get them out on the field safely um, at this time of year. Uh, it would get the students act, active with structure uh, and good for mental health. You hear from a lot of families about the structure and, and how athletics really keep the kids motivated in, in school and academics. Uh, as we, we've said, and I know it's been a hot topic this whole time with all the meetings you guys have had to go through is the mental health of the students, um, the, the emotional, um, social emotional part of it. And, and sports do offer a lot to these individuals. Another pro for the season right now would be the weather. Fall weather is obviously a lot more ideal than potentially February weather to play sports such as golf, cross country, soccer, or field hockey. Uh, the field conditions would line up with that as well. We do have our one turf field. We do have our fields at O'Malley and, and other various fields, um, but the field conditions would likely be better at, if we were to do a fall one than a fall two. Uh, There's also a very rare situation right now um, with the four season opportunity, student athletes could actually play four different sports this year. The MIAA did say, um, for example, uh, you could have a football player run the cross country team because football isn't playing until uh, February now, or one of our competitive cheerleaders that would usually go in the fall, they could actually play for the girls soccer team or, or what, choose one of the fall sports. So that is a rare opportunity that you're hopefully not going to see very often in, in the future or back to normal uh, times, but that is something, a, a different pro that would keep more of our student athletes active during this time. So, um, some of the cons, uh, if we were to, to shoot to play during this immediate fall season, um, potentially not all of our NEC teams could participate. As I just mentioned, even in today's most up-to-date numbers, there are three schools currently in the red that would not be allowed to participate. Uh, there's obviously always the chance, and you have Karen Carroll on here talking about many of the topics, as far as a COVID-19 a spike or we get a cases or a cluster, could happen. And if it happens, um, there's obviously going to be guidelines with, with quarantining um, student athletes, potentially shutting down sports. Um, one note is if the fall season is to start, fall one, if say we were to start on uh, September 18th or October 2nd, and as soon as you have one day, after that, you're committed to the fall one season. If you would prefer, if your season gets halted and you want to try to get in the fall two in February at that point, it does have to be a, an approved waiver um, by the MIAA's District 5 Athletic Committee that I would have to go through that process. So that's just something to be aware of is obviously the chance that there could be a shutdown. And the last con I did mention earlier in the slides was for this immediate fall season, uh, there is no MIAA sponsored tournament. Obviously, we're trying to keep um, it in smaller groups of schools we'd be playing. We don't want student athletes traveling all over playing schools from lots of various parts of the state or uh, other conferences. So they have decided for this one season at this point, the, the fall one, there would be no state tournament. As far as the fall two season, uh, which as mentioned a few times, would be a February 22nd start date. The pros for that is the potential that we could have all the Northeastern Conference 
um, schools participate. At that point, maybe these three schools that are in the red are out of the red, and there's a better chance that as a league, we can play with one another. Uh, the opportunity for student athletes still have the practice. They could practice during the fall one. We would have some restrictions. So they could be out there staying active right now, knowing that they have the potential to have a season playing in the fall two season. The MIAA did waive a very uh, important rule that they have. Rule number 40 is about out of season contact for our coaches. They waived that rule from September 18th to July 3rd. Uh, they wanted to give the opportunity. We have so many different situations now with no spring sports. We obviously just had this past school year, um, everything going right now that they were leaving it up to the school districts or the in-house principal to decide if our coaches could start practicing um, with kids out of season. It would be only the short time frame that would be allowed, but that would be something if our season was pushed to fall to the soccer's, the field hockey's, we could still get them out there in some capacity right now and uh, have them practice to prepare for the season in, in February. Uh, and there is, in fall two, they have not definitely said yet, there's no MIAA state tournament. Um, it is a shorter time frame, so it would be very difficult, but as of now, there's the potential they could have a state tournament and playoff. For fall two season, the, the cons of it, um, I think is the most obvious and anyone that's had discussions is the, the potential weather issues. We all know our New England weather, it, it's hard enough in the third week of March trying to start our spring sports season, um, but starting on February 22nd for, um, it's going to be difficult already for football and cheerleading, but add in field hockey, uh, boys, girls, soccer, but even most important, golf and um, cross country would be very difficult for potential weather issues and potential field issues. We do have our one turf field. If you've got several feet of snow on it, it's pretty much unplayable, but then trying to put all the teams on there because O'Malley might be under snow or too muddy or wet. Um, so that's some of the issues, the, the cons of that. Uh, some of our venues would actually just be unusable. Um, Bash Rocks Golf Course is unbelievable. They treat our kids great, um, but there's no way we could ever expect them to open their golf course at the end of February, even in March is difficult. Um, so for them to do that, they obviously we would never expect them to open it for, for Gloucester High and take a chance of damaging the course. Um, our cross country course, uh, the last couple of years at Stage Four Park, in years past at Ravenswood, would be very difficult to have that in running condition uh, in late February, early March. Uh, and as I mentioned as well before, the grass fields. And then the last con uh, with the fall two season is just the COVID 19 status, but it's like any time right now. Um, it would be late February. A lot of people talk about flu season and getting through all of that we don't even know what it's going to be like. So it's potential. Maybe those three teams could come back and play. Everyone could play, or maybe there'll be more teams in the red. We don't know. It's just a, a question we all have. And for the final slide, just some other topics um, that would be, that are going to be major focuses for us, no matter what season we start in or try and play in, just to, to start putting on the radar. Uh, number one is going to be the transportation issue. Um, I got to meet with Adam uh, last week and just start discussing plans and everything and not knowing anything that's going on, but just to get to know one another. Um, the, the spacing issues on buses, uh, obviously we would not be able to put JV teams and varsity teams on the same buses as we always have. Um, so them requiring their own buses is going to in increase costs substantially when you start doubling up basically bus uh, needs. Uh, there have been other leagues in the, in the state and even some of the schools in our conference have discussed potentially playing uh, sub varsity level games on weekends um, where there is more bus availability. Some places have more availability of fields and uh, there's the option. We obviously um, steer everyone away from it during regular times that we have all the student athletes ride the buses to and from games but the opportunity on weekends if parents would drive the student athletes and had permission slips. It's just ideas that have been thrown out there. Uh, other topics, purchasing of uh, PPE equipment, not in our original budget. Obviously we did the budget last year. For this year, we didn't plan on all this and you guys, have, the committee and, and Gary Frisch and all the principals, everyone's gone through this at each school at, at this point that having to add all this, uh, these special items. Scheduling. Um, any schedules we've had, which we've had for five months, are basically thrown out the window because um, we're going to need to redo it for a shortened season, different teams, but that's on the athletic directors. We would have no problem trying to put something together. Uh, that's our job, and, and that would be a, a big topic, though, is, is what levels of sports play. Uh, safety guidelines. 
uh, the MIAA did send about uh, eight pages worth of guidelines for each individual sport. Um, also touching safety issues, whether just walking into the stadium and every student athlete getting a, a temperature check prior to, to walking on the field. Fan restrictions we'll have to look at uh, at our facilities. Um, levels of play, able to participate. As previously mentioned, the sub-varsity levels. Um, will we be able to support all of those? Um, I know with different schools with O'Malley being hybrid, leaving all the kids leaving campus to be able to get them back is a very large issue that would have to be addressed. Um, Lynn and I briefly talked a while ago when it didn't seem the season was going to go on, but that, that's a very difficult one to, to look into, but um, just for all levels, our JV levels as well and, and varsity. Uh, user fees will have to be addressed. Um, just looking at the cost, when we look at the transportation and everything, they generally have a, a base user fee for each season. That would be a topic that I'm sure will, will be discussed. And there's going to be plenty more questions uh, every day. Uh, my coaches have been great. The student athletes, uh, this has been a very difficult time. For many of you that know me, I'm, I'm big in communicating, uh, trying to get out as much via social media or email. It's been uh, very difficult when we don't have answers and they've all been very patient and they're waiting. They all want to play, um, but they all have tons of questions and there's not many answers. So there will be many more to come, but uh, hopefully that gives you a good idea um, of all the topics that we've been covering lately. Thank you, Brian, very, very much for that, that just, just great presentation, really laid things out very clearly. Um, uh, if there are questions from the, from the committee, and then um, I, I'll have a rec, uh, rec, give you a sort of recommend a motion to consider um, in terms of a, a possible vote or at least a decision tonight. So you're looking for a, yeah, a decision tonight, um, just to be clear. Um, if so that's possible, I, we understand you know things move quickly here and, and need to move quickly, but but that's up to the committee still to decide that. Okay. All right, Joel. Thank you. Uh, first question is super quick, um, and I missed it. I'm sorry. Is the expectation that these uh, players would be wearing masks, or would this be a mask less time for the students uh, for during, the, during practices and during games? Yeah, for the majority of it, it would be on their uh, maybe wearing masks. Uh, they're very specific in the MIAA guidelines for every sport on there's potential times, say for example, soccer, where they're away from someone and the ball might be on the other side of the field where they could pull the mask down. But once there's any sort of activity or anything gets near, they're with, within distance, basically as if you're handling in school or not in school, but in the public, you're walking by someone, you got to pull your mask on. Um, that's how it is in each of the sports, but pretty much all of the sports um, do have very specific guidelines. It took them a while to get that out to really break down all the individual sports. And that's uh, practices also, same thing? Yes, everything we'll do. I sent, once those guidelines came out, I sent them directly to my coaches right away. And I said, no matter what happens this fall, whether it's practices, um, games, anything, you're going to be following all these guidelines between myself as administration, my staff, my coaches, student athletes, they're going to have an understanding of uh, it, it's not summertime. I know some of them have been doing workouts where things might get lax. Um, if we get any opportunities, we're not going to um, take any chances. We're going to follow everything to a T. Melissa? Um, Brian, thank you for that great presentation. I love when you get up and talk before us about sports because I just hear the passion in your voice and it makes it so exciting. And I can say that from someone who doesn't play sports, so you can, you can tell it's obvious. Um, so I am someone that I truly want to support this. I believe our kids need sports. Um, but quick question. So which sports would be in the fall one? What I, I missed that somehow. Which sports are we talking about? The so fall one, the, the ones that could play right away would be boys and girls soccer. Field soccer, yeah. Yep, field hockey. Boys and girls cross country. And golf. Okay. My, my biggest concern besides health and safety, and, and I think Joe covered that asking the math questions, because um, that seems like the best we can do, is transportation. I mean, transportation comes at a high cost. And we have regulations now of how many people can be on a bus. So correct me if I'm wrong, do we, is there some sort of regulation that kids, students who travel have to take the bus? Was that some sort of policy in our district before? I thought I remembered 
hearing something about that. If if the students are traveling to go to a some sort of competition that they have to take the bus, it's required, or is that not true? I'm pretty sure, I don't know if anyone else knows it, that it, it is in the school committee bylaws, I believe, or, or um, handbook. Um, it is kind of, yeah. it is an expectation that's laid out before every season as part of the team, as part of the, the um, just growing up and being part of the, the part of the organization that the team goes together, they leave together. If we have a rare situation and there's a doctor's appointment or there's some uh, something going on that a parent will then get, uh, will provide a permission slip that they could pick the kid up from the game or if they need to bring them to, maybe they had a doctor's appointment, they need to bring them straight to a field. We do that occasionally, but not very often. We, we really prefer all the student athletes to be on the bus. Um, as far as it being, I think it, like, not off the top of my head, but I think it is in, in the school committee um, handbook. So with that being said, I mean, I think we can call COVID a rare occasion, hopefully, um, that it's gonna be gone. <laughs> um, and I can't help but wonder if some thought can be put into you know, we've been getting letters from parents that want us to support this. Um, and I'm one of those members that want to support this. I don't, I don't want a reason not to. But I would just want to look at our bylaws to figure that out and wonder if we can get some assistance from parents to help travel. Because if we can only put one third of the kids on the bus that we usually put on, you're talking three buses when there'd usually be one. You're talking three bus drivers. I mean, the cost is going to be enormous. And I don't want to say no because of busing costs. You know what I mean? So I'm wondering how, what other districts are doing? Um, are there, do they have the same sort of regulations where the kids have to be on the bus? I mean, I understand the camaraderie and all the fun stuff that happens on a bus, but I just think during this time, if parents are willing to step up and help out, um, I mean, if they want their kids in sports, playing sports right now, maybe they're willing to do the travel, or maybe they themselves feel it's better for them to get in a car and travel as opposed to getting on a bus. I don't know. But I would just hope that those conversations happen because I don't want to see us in a situation. I mean, our budget is tight. You know, we have a, we have a lot pulling at us this year, um, and we don't know how this year is going to play out. And I just don't want to see us. Um, trying to figure out how we're going to pay for this if it comes down to transportation. So that is my only concern, but know that you always 100% have my support to play sports because I'm someone that believes in putting choices for families. I'm not going to tell a family or a child they can't play. That's up to their mother or father. Um, I just want to provide the op opportunity. So I just want to make sure that if we do provide the opportunity that we're able to support the busing if we have to, or if we can change our bylaws and find a different way and be creative, that would be helpful as well. Yeah, definitely, no, thank you for that input. I definitely agree with that. It's, it has come up quite a bit already with the athletic directors before even any decisions have been made that we know that's gonna be a top issue that everyone's gonna to need to address individually with their, their districts. Joel? Um, thanks. So. Is there going to be any alteration to the way in which the sports are played? Meaning there were some summer leagues that were played, like there was a summer hockey league that was played um, at Stage Fort, and the players were stuck in zones, so they weren't interacting with as many players in the field. You know, I know Mr. Cook used to coach soccer. I coach soccer, and I'm just thinking, you know, that is a close contact sport. I'm constantly telling my players to get in someone's face, to get in someone's personal space, to put a hand on them, to put a butt on them. Like, like this is, you know, everything that we've been, we've been putting into practice in these classrooms that we'll be putting, it seems to be like the complete opposite of how I would coach a student to play these sports. And so I'm wondering if these sports are going to be adjusted to make them quote unquote safer. Yeah, no, they, they definitely have. That was uh, where each of the MIAA board of directors approved. Each sport has their own subcommittee that they went through. And as it, mentioned it's like a six to eight page document for each individual sport and soccer is one of the biggest ones they we knew even before coming out during the summer we had seen the uh, youth guidelines where uh, various rules such as no heading the ball throw-ins were not going to be allowed there would be kick-ins uh, corner kicks would be indirect kicks and uh, <clears throat> list after li I mean task after task of, of different updates to each sport that I, as soon as I sent it on to the coaches, I told them you need to really review this because um, 
to a point, is it worth it? I mean, <clears throat> we want to get the kids out there, but if it then it's not even remotely close to what the sport is, is it worth it? But then there's that factor of, okay, or well, you could be playing in February. Um, a lot of our coaches reviewed it. There's a few things that it does make it difficult for them. Some of our coaches have been coaching for 10 to 20 years. And like you said, you've coached, uh, Mr. Cook has coached that it's tough to make changes. Myself, if it was baseball and they told me certain items that I couldn't do, I would have a very difficult time changing. So there are a lot of sports specific and I can send on any of those if, if you would uh, be interested to see what they are. But those are the guidelines that if it's done by the state and it's done by the MIAA, we have to follow it because some of them, some of my coaches have asked, well, could our league change this rule or that? And it's, it's levied by the MIAA. And I said that we, we need to follow that. If we get out there, it is what it is. And, and unfortunately, some of the sports like that street hockey during the summer could look a little bit different. Kathy? Um, to answer Joel's question the, on the soccer, I know they're already like no corner kicks, no heading, no slide tackling or whatever it's called. Um, so I think they're already trying to put that into practice at the captain's um, scrimmages. Um, I also want to support this. I think sports are um, absolutely part of the whole educational experience. I've always thought that. Um, and I also want to think that if transportation would be an issue for the fall, it's going to be an issue for the winter and for other ones. So I think with this particular vote, uh, I am in full agreement. I've heard from many parents that say we will do anything and everything we can to get this, the sports off the ground. And, um, you know, we all know that youth sports don't have buses. So parents are used to kind of making it happen for their kids. And I think in this particular situation, it's probably going to have to be more the norm for all of the sports. Um, if we, you know, if we're used to taking one bus, we probably should try to continue to do one bus and figure out how we, find, you know, volunteers or other people that can uh, get the rest of the kids there. It'll also allow, I think, different levels, both varsity and JV, because you wouldn't really want to have, um, you know, you probably can't do three levels of a sport, freshman, JV, and varsity for all the complication reasons of, of social distancing. But I think it's very appropriate and important that we do JV and varsity. Uh, Safafia. Um, you know what? I'm really confused. I really am because now, not as a school committee, but as a mayor, um, I met with you and Mr. Loomis today and told me we have $1.4 million extra that we have to come up with the city side beside the $1 million with the grant. Now we're talking about there was 33 children that we have to supply buses to because actually um, they're underserved and not for nothing, but they can't get to the schools because the parents don't own vehicles. So that's on the back of my head. But yet the teachers, the fear of what's going on. As I was, we were talking last week, we went from white to green. So if these kids are playing sports and they go, uh, you know, you're not gonna play against the red, but everyone's green. And next thing you know, while they're playing, someone's a red because that's how we found out last week. I was talking, remember? And someone said, just so you know what, Mayor, we're now green without, you know, and we are still green. I got noticed tonight. I, I just have, you know, I understand how the parents say that, you know, um, as far as mentally and social wise that the children have to get out there, they have to do some things. And a lot of the children, uh, especially children who have uh, certain um, familiarized with last year of playing sports, you know, and doing things and now they haven't and, and they went from being top of their class to, you know, to having a, a, a mental breakdowns, let's say, I'm, I'm not going to say any kids' names or whatever. We, I understand that. We, we, we're trying to get all these services. But as a mayor, I'm looking at, okay, additive buses, um, going from uh, green to red while you're playing the game, uh, parents giving them rides, carpooling. I'm sorry, but I mean, you, you're going to say you can only drive your own kid. If you're going to carpool, are you going to watch them? Are you going to babysit them? And did we ask any of the teachers how comfortable they feel that their students are now playing sports and then coming into our schools because they're going into other communities? You know, we're trying to keep it from here. I have people close the bridge, close the bridge, you know, when we we're in March. And, and, and now you're telling me you want to go across that bridge and you don't know really who you're going to play against and then bring it back. And, and, and we're arguing, I mean, did you talk to the teachers? You know, I know this is with the parents too, but don't forget, you have a lot of teachers who have to do um, the um, 
you know, remote because they're in fear or whatever, but are we going to lose the rest of the ones that we're trying to do in hybrid because we didn't have enough respective and to ask them of how do you feel about this? I mean, do you want the sports? Should we wait a little bit? Can we figure out what we're doing first in the classrooms and how we're going to get what were the services we have in school? How are we going to afford these services? I mean, you're working on a field house that, you know what, don't forget that was pre-COVID that the city side took out. Now I'm talking to you as a mayor in the city side. Remember that. I was elected as your mayor. And I have to worry about that. We have a lot of things that are coming up. And yet, we, 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 you want me to vote tonight on something that we didn't have a plan for. And we don't have a, a budget for. And we don't have nothing to go fall back on. So you're coming. You don't have a budget. You're already coming with me for $1.4 million. So you don't even have enough buses to give to the kids who need rides now, who need to get into school. Never mind going into a game. Now you're talking about Kathy because her son plays soccer, good for her. But the fact is, you're talking about, we'll give him a ride, but she's going to carpool with somebody else or someone else's, and who's going to do that? They're going to wear masks in the car. And then if they come back to school, what's the consequences? More masks, more PPE, more, you know, who's going to take their temperatures? Who's going to do that? I'm confused. I don't mean to sound like an alarmist, but you know what, while you guys are all talking, I know a lot of you getting texts and emails and everything else like I am, and, and they're good questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Melissa? Um, thank you. So it's my understanding, because I'm getting some people reaching out to me right now. Have, have we done some sort of sports with waivers and parents already driving kids? this year or at the end of last year, something with wrestling or another sport, has that happened? I yeah. thought I heard not too long ago that parents were signing waivers and I know other parents were surprised that parents were signing waivers. I, I heard a little rumbling about that. So can you tell me what we've already been doing as far as waivers, what the waiver is, what are they actually waiving, I'd like to know, um, and how transportation has been working for sports that have already gone on? Uh, well, Pre-COVID, uh, there were, would be occasional times at the end, usually postseason um, opportunities of sports that don't have, not all of our kids qualify, individual sports, track and field, wrestling, where it might only be anywhere from one to five individuals, where we're not going to get an entire bus. And many of those events happen on weekends. So we would have the general um, liability waiver that uh, the, the families would sign, understanding they're going to take their uh, student athlete to and from whatever competition they have. Occasionally, uh, one sport you did bring up, wrestling, uh, is a different sport where there's uh, sometimes on a Saturday, they'll have a meet that is literally a 10 hour meet. They might leave GHS at six in the morning and they don't get back here till four or five at night. So what's happened sometimes there is uh, they'll sign a waiver. We'll have a bus take them to the event as a team, have them all there early and ready to prepare. Um, but the parents, because the majority go there, would then take them back. So we wouldn't have to have a bus sit there from 6 a.m. until 4 at night. Because those costs and, and working with Kathy Verga in the, in the past, those were through the roof for just one event where we could find an alternative. And it was um, done with the waivers and the liability signed off on that. So, so let me ask you this too, Brian. So you are in the teachers union, so you must talk to teachers. Um, I'm not in the, no, I'm not in the teachers. Oh, you're not in the teachers. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You're separate. You're the, you're the athletic director. So working with teachers at the high school, have you received any feedback on how teachers would feel about kids playing sports? I mean, have you had the opportunity to talk to any teachers to find out what their reaction is? I mean, we're all super sensitive right now to who kids are co-mingling with, and rightfully so. Um, but at the same time, there's many districts, like I saw on Fox News tonight, that Peabody is on their way to doing this. They voted last night, um, and that many other districts are, are playing sports, um, recognizing the importance of it. Have you reached out to get any feedback to find out how um, mostly high school teachers, uh, there'll probably be some O'Malley, but how they would feel um, with their kids that they have in class being exposed at a different level? And, and you may not have, and that's okay, but I'm just curious if you've had the opportunity to have any of those conversations. Yeah, I, um, I probably had more interaction with the teachers that are also coaches, whether fall coaches or other seasons. I see a lot yeah. of them, I speak with a lot of them. And um, from my sense, the majority feel safe having them go to sports. 
Um, I haven't spoken with a lot of the teachers that maybe I don't interact with daily. I pass in the hallways here and there, um, but I haven't had conversations with them. But I haven't, it hasn't been a full-fledged conversation with, with a lot of teachers. And how many of the districts did you say that I've already um, approved sports for the fall one season that we usually communicate right. with or that we usually play with? Right, I can show the committee just where we are with other districts if, if you don't, if, if that's all right, folks. Yep. Let me just show you. Um, you can should be able to see if, this. If this is becoming the norm. So you can see a slide that says NEC district's decisions. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, so as you can see, Lynn and Winthrop are in red, so they can't participate. So let me just back up. Um, uh, seven of the NEC district superintendents met, it might have been a week ago, a week and a half ago, I can't remember at this point, to, to discuss this. What we discussed and then followed up with the rest of the superintendents at that point was the idea of starting the season to practice, sorry, starting practices um, on October 2nd. So that's why you see some of this and that's what we've been working on. So Marblehead is, has, has voted, it's Marblehead School Committee, I'm sorry, has voted to go fall one starting October 2nd. Peabody, the subcommittee voted to participate in fall one, uh, also October 2nd. Salem, voted, I think, last night to go to fall one, but wants to begin practices sooner, September 22nd. Um, Beverly's meeting tonight, recommending October 2nd start for practices for fall one. Masconomit uh, voted for fall one. And then Saugus is voting next week. They will be recommending fall one with October start. The reason, just to quick, the rationale on October start for practices, which does push, push the season later, as Brian described, um, was just the notion of let's get into school, let's get some things working, let's not try to do it all at the same time, um, you know, because of the start is, is challenging for all, all the districts. And so that was a sentiment among the superintendents was, and that's the reason for a little bit of a delay on starting practices. Um, but do acknowledge that it makes the season shorter and may uh, cause some challenges with um, just daylight, honestly. So um, but that's where folks are um, and I can pull it off now. And thank you for those answers. And um, I guess I just go back to the transportation. I just think that um, we're really going to need the help of the parents to make this happen because financially, you, you just heard, I mean, we're, we're strapped. But um, I know the parents that want to make this happen. And I know having a parent, being a parent before of someone who plays sports, you do everything possible to get your kids to games if you can. And if not, you call a friend. Um, so I would just know that there's going to be some sort of expectation that there's going to be assistance with transportation. Uh, Jonathan, I think I see Samantha has a question. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, so I preface this just to say that, you know, I'm a huge advocate um, of our sports in Gloucester. I um, was a former student athlete, but I, has this been vetted by our public health department? I mean, we we made decisions based on opening schools, asking lots of questions of Karen Carroll, and you know she was here tonight. But I I personally didn't know we were going to vote on this tonight, so I, I didn't think to ask her questions about this. Um, and again, this is just another one of those situations where I I find it slightly comical that the school committee has to decide something. Um, that really I think should be vetted more carefully by health officials. Um, so has this been has this been run by our public health department? And, and if so, what's their recommendation? I have not had I have not had a conversation with Karen Carroll about about athletics. Okay. I do I know. know Go ahead. Um, Bye. I was just gonna say, as far yeah, we haven't had specifics with Karen at this point in our immediate uh, Department of Public Health, but uh, the MIAA did meet with, uh, went through the state DPH, uh, obviously DESE with things, EEA, um, all of those areas. So at least for that, they're just giving us the umbrella. But yes, in the, um, district wide, just for us, we haven't had specific conversations yet. Okay, and so when you say so, so basically the recommendations were that they felt like on a state level, it's safe if they're not in the red. Yep, correct. Okay. Joel? Thank you, I uh, appreciate those two questions. I was curious, 
you know, I think two big stakeholders are the city health department and the GTA, especially given, you know, for those, uh, those who are participating in the negotiations, I need to explain it to, and those out there who have watched some of the negotiations, um, you know, GTA input, I think is crucial before we make any decision on this, but I want to, I want to make sure that I understand if, if we don't do the fall one, the fall one sports, despite the fact they would be getting ready to play in February somehow, potentially, they would still be able to practice as a team, um, you know, uh, on our facilities throughout the fall. So they'd still be getting the exercise, the camaraderie, that sort of stuff. Would we also be able to scrimmage, you know, you know, like Rockport or, or Manchester and like that, we let it, you know, or no, okay. Unfortunately, the MIAA, that's as soon as you play an outside uh, another uh, school, it's considered interscholastic, and that basically starts your season, whether a scrimmage or a game. So anything we would do if we were not to participate in fall one would just all be internally with GHS student athlete. But there would be no limit as to the ability within the district to organize practices, you know, inter-team scrimmage sort of situation, that sort of stuff. Yep. Yeah, we would just, at that point, be following still all the guidelines the MIAA put in place. Like for soccer, we would be saying, listen, you're going to prepare for your fall two season now with these rules and uh, with the EEA guidelines of cohorts. Practices are supposed to be in co cohorts of groups of 10 around the field. So all of those guidelines would still get followed um, on our part, even if we were not playing outside, outside schools. Okay, so Safafia. You know, like I said, I talk to a lot of parents who their children need some kind of a sport or activity or to participate just to get out there, which I understand. As the mayor, um, I can't vote on this tonight, vote present. I don't want to, you know, um, stop anything, uh, but I have to, as uh, consciously as your mayor, um, I have to vote present on this because, first of all, I need to talk to my Board of Health. I need to talk because, as you know, Salem was red. Now you're saying we can play against them and one changes. I just have that concern. I have that concern that if you knew this was coming up, um, and not for nothing, but, you know, we've been talking. We had an earlier meeting earlier. We could say this was coming up. Um, we need to discuss this. Uh, can we work? Karen was on here, like Samantha said. Karen, because Karen thinks that everyone that, you know, she says you're outside, you're doing things, it's, as long as you're not touching one another, that kind of contact sport, you know, it's good. They want you to go out. The governor says go outside. That's why we're in swimming. I'm not against that, people. I'm not against the sports. I'm not saying that, you know, soccer, you you have to go over-exaggerate and, oh, you know, you're not going to, I understand all of that. I understand the golf, and I understand that it's not going to be contact. But I also have to understand, too, that, you know, yes, you do have to talk to the teachers. Yes, we do need to find out because not for nothing. If I have students who have no transportation to school because they don't have a vehicle and they purposely said that they wanted to do remote because they were afraid. And then we found out after talking to them is that they don't have a vehicle. And are we turning kids away from not playing sports because they're going to be too embarrassed saying, I'm not going to be able to get my kid to, to the sports? And are we jeopardizing saying, well, then you can take a ride. Well, carpool. Is that what we want to do? How can you carpool? I mean, th there's a lot of questions. I want people to play sports, but I don't want just, you know, not everyone to play. I want everyone to have a chance if they want to, to be able to. Isn't that what sports is all about is to make sure we all interact. And yet we don't have transportation because I can't even drive to school, but yet you're going to have parents do that. And I've seen it in little league. And I've seen that in other issues that you have no offense to people Yes, you have a carpool and click, but they always seem to leave out certain people all the time. So I don't feel that we're 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 going to fix one problem by causing another. So to me, I don't want to hurt anyone else until I get more advice. So tonight, if you're going to force a vote for tonight, unless you want to table this, then I am going to have to vote present. I'm not going to have to. I don't want to vote no because in my heart, I believe these kids need to play sports, but we didn't get enough information. So, I mean, we're meeting again, you can table this because you still have time, but I don't feel that a vote should be taken tonight without some other questions and, uh, and answers. Um, so, so what exactly is the, the timeline? Um, is it critical that we uh, make a decision this evening? 
knowing that we meet every night <laughs> to have a school committee meeting. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I mean, Brian and James help me with this. I mean, I'm just looking at the, at the, at the dates here and I would say, you know, if we're shooting for October 2nd start, it's not essential tonight, but I haven't discussed that with, with both of you. Um, I need, I need some input on this from, from the two of you. Yeah, I would, I would agree. It, it, if you can't make it, if you're not comfortable with the decision, as, as James and I abstained from the original vote two weeks ago, uh, it's understandable. And there are some other on, on, Ben's slide showed there is at least one or two other schools that I believe their school committees meet the beginning of next week. So uh, we don't definitely don't need the, the issue to be forced tonight if you're not comfortable with it. For the, for the record, we don't at this point, I don't think, have a school committee meeting actually set for next week. There's a building finance subcommittee, but of course you can change that, but, but just want you to know that. I, don't, I think I'm right about that. We can, we can have meetings. <laughs> um, we still have a, um, Melissa, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just wondering, I mean, I know a concern is the Board of Health, you know, because we want to hear from the Board of Health. Um, I would just suggest, you know, obviously other Board of Health have weighed in on in other communities and the MIAA itself would be weighing in with health officials to even put this out there. Um, but I'm wondering if a vote is to go tonight, if we could say that we're, we're going to vote to approve subject to Karen Carroll reviewing it, and if there's any reason she feels it shouldn't go forward, we can bring it back. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there as an, as an idea so that things can get started um, if, if it's the Board of Health that's holding people up. I'm not, I mean, I know teachers, we want them to weigh in, but um, I don't know that this should be a teacher's decision. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear about it no matter what the decision is, knowing that teachers have kids that play sports. And I know there's teachers out there that want their kids playing sports. So, um, but the Board of Health is, is a good resource in Gloucester. I mean, Karen Carroll is great. Um, but I know that I would feel comfortable approving it subject to her review and if there's things that she has concerns about, we can always discuss it, but at least things can get started and messaging can get out there because obviously there's a lot of work to do if we're going to be um, looking into transportation and other expenses. Joel. Uh, thanks. I think, to be fair, I think Laura had her hand up first, if that's okay. I can wait if Laura can go. I can go. Laura. Thank you, Joel. Um, I just, I mean, I think everyone's asked really great and important questions here. Um, I'm struggling because I, you know, sports matter a lot. I played sports in high school. It just, it matters to everyone who plays. It matters to the community. Um, but I was thinking about what the mayor said. Um, you know, it, it, how, I mean, you guys would know better, uh, James and Brian. I mean, if we went forward with this in a way that kids were driven, because the budget is certainly a huge issue. That, that kids were driven to games and practices. My sense is that that would necessarily exclude kids who don't have access to being driven, a parent who can do it, a car. Um, you're, the ones, you're the ones who know. What would you say to that? How, how would you read that? How could we work with that? How could we change that? What do you think? Yeah, I can uh, definitely. I mean, Brian, I think either of us can, you know, there are certainly students that, um, you know, uh, I'm not, I won't speak for Brian, Brian has his own experience, but who would not be able to provide this, um, you know, in um, their own transportation um, to um, away games, for sure. Um, and so we would work to, you know, do what we always do, which is make sure kids get to games because we do provide this. It's one of the things about high school athletics is we do provide the transportation. We close the gap in ways that club sports, for instance, you know, are based on money in lots of ways. And we, and, and, and we provide a different opportunity um, for all kids to be able to participate. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons we hired Brian was because he was all about increasing the participation rates, getting more kids to participate in athletics across three sports, maybe even four seasons this year as Brian presented. So we would be committed to figuring out how to maximize the transportation budget, you know, within whatever 
uh, whatever is available to us to make sure that it's not a, a, an issue of equity uh, around athletics, because we neither of us would uh, that wouldn't be acceptable to any of us. I think also, I mean, I, I want to, I mean, I, we, we do have money already in the budget for transportation related to athletics. Um, this is what would be additional if necessary. And I don't think we would suggest that the only way students can, could get to games would be like, you know, private carpooling. That would be supplemental. So we'd have to provide transportation. And if it was the choice between we needed, you know, uh, a bus and then plus some kids, you know, uh, we could potentially organize both, but we, we couldn't just rely on, um, you know, private transportation, I don't believe at all. And for, for a number of different reasons, including the ones around equity and access, which James has already said very clearly. So, so that's, I mean, I, I assume that anyway, I have full faith in, in everything you're doing. Um, so it just, it, for me tonight, you know, given the issues around both um, the health issues of going to different districts, having kids, um, and budget issues, um, it just feels like we may need more. We may need more information before we can we can really vote, or at least before I feel comfortable voting on this. So let me, um, if I can, just maybe help us move along, because um, what we can be able to do is. Um, work some on transportation. We not, may not have all the answers by, by next week, but make some progress in transportation. Um, we can follow up with Karen Carroll um, and, and get her understanding of what she knows about this and about um, what they're trying to do, um, particularly around whether that's, um, you know, going to other communities and playing. Um, and would it also be helpful for, to share with you the MIA guidance just because you know, just in the few things Brian has said, I mean, there are very detailed steps that are being taken within each practices, sports, travel, and some of that level of detail may help you understand, you know, the precautions that need to be taken. So if we got you those three pieces um, for next week, and if, and if you want, Karen Carroll can, 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 you know, be here, I can ask her to be here as well on this. Would that be helpful in, in moving things forward and then um, looking at next week to to make a final consideration. I think, I think um, it's, it, what it appears to me is there's a couple of uh, issues here that, that we're not gonna get the answer to tonight. And one is, one is how, um, what the budgetary impact of, of having an equitable um, sports program is um, with the restrictions on, on, um, on transportation, 20 kids on, a, on one of those great big buses um, so, and as well as the, 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 the um, impact on the, on the, um, uh, health and safety of the students and coming, going to other communities. So, um, I'm going to suggest that we table this and we can, uh, we have BNF scheduled for next Wednesday, um, I believe at five o'clock, um, we could have a school committee meeting afterwards. We'll, we'll we can figure that out. So it wouldn't be be just a special school committee meeting it wouldn't half the people would already be there so um, but everybody's got their hands raised so let's go uh, Safafia you were you were yeah have, thank you um, I, I would like a copy of that and we should have had it beforehand I would um, so I could talk it over with other mayors and everything else to see what they said in their school committee and how they feel because like I said we're only appointed member of your school committee we're not elected so we have different phases that we have to go to. Um, I would like some more information, but um, not for nothing, um, Ben, really upsets me is hearing that, well, we had money in the budget. Well, you're coming with me for $1.4 million and I have to take out of the taxpayers' money. I had to put $70,000 for air vents. You didn't want to, we had to have a special meeting with Mike because it, it wasn't just Carol's information that we took, Karen Carroll, in order to open the schools. Um, we had to ask the teachers this, you're in negotiations. And here for, for sports, all of a sudden, we're waving every little thing. You know, um, I've been working for two friggin' weeks, had to tell Melissa about 33 kids who can't go to school because they didn't have transportation. And all of a sudden, we have transportation. Well, you know, that should be for education first. I'm sorry that I'm giving you all hell, but that really, really upsets me when I have to deal with the taxpayers. We're dealing about new schools, new this, new that, and everything's being blamed on me. And yet all of a sudden this money, and I'm supposed to trust the city that we're supposed to be working together. So I would like to see some of these numbers. I would like to see some of the budget again. And I really would like to work together. I have no problems with 
following the guidelines, following DC, getting the transportation because the child. Now, are we waiving fees or are we still charging fees for athletic programs? Because right now with COVID, half of these parents haven't worked. And now we're trying to get them back to unemployment with the $300 stimulus. What are we going to do? Are we going to have any, any things for ch people who can't afford our own fees? Because isn't that how we go on on the sports? Is that we charge you the athletic fees? Are we still charging fees for the, the to join these programs? Yeah, the plan yeah. Would, it, it, that was obviously on the, the last page would be a topic we have to discuss. We do charge fees currently now. You've got to, your regular fee, your reduced lunch, and your free lunch fee, but we do charge fees for all sports. Okay, so you can't go buy the free lunch because now the CDA just gave everyone one free breakfast and one free lunch for the whole Gloucester public school system. So does that make everyone eligible? There's a lot of things we have to look at. I don't want to sound like, you know, okay, she's the witch of the bitch because the fact is, like I said, there's a lot on all my shoulders. We have a lot of things coming up too. I have the city side. We have a lot of things that we're doing. And the fact is I want to make sure we do it right so we can say we did everything. We've got in this far in our education program and our health program and everything we have in Gloucester, we had 70,000 people on a weekend, yet we still have five because we work together. I don't want us to fail them. I want the sports to come so these kids can be out there because Karen Carroll, the governor, we said, it's good to go out there. They want you to be out there. I want to make sure that every child has a chance. I want to make sure every child that needs transportation to school gets it first. Then I want to make sure that these kids who don't have transportation to school be able to get transportation like James said, that you know they're going to need it. He honestly said they don't have transportation. I want, and I don't want them to feel embarrassed to come to us or, in, and, or not have a child go because they're going to feel embarrassed because they can't afford a fee or they're still working to help out their family members or whatever. We need to really work on this. Give me what you have. I can do my own. Melissa does her own everything else. And this way we can vote consciously with our hearts next week. I can't vote today. Joel. Thank you. So yeah, just to be like, based on what I heard tonight, you wouldn't be able to get a, a yes out of me. One thing that I would need at a future meeting, and so I'll put it out there now so that it's out there and there's some time. This all just kind of seems a little bonkers to me. You know, we're putting so many protocols in place about social distancing, keeping students away from each other. You know, I, again, I was just at Vets today hearing about how, you know, kindergartners are gonna use different doors than the first graders, we use different doors than the second graders. K through two, we use different playground equipment outside than three through five because a third grader can't use playground equipment that a second grader just, you know, for bubble purposes. Um, at the high school, if and when we ever get into that building, only half the students can be there at a time because we don't want too many students from the same town and the same grade near each other. But then those same students could either get on a bus or get in a carpool and go to Danvers and get within inches heavy breathing, even with a mask, with you know students that are way outside their bubble. They're outside their school bubble, their grade bubble, they're outside their city bubble. It just seems so counter to everything we're putting in place everywhere else. And it puts the entire school, possibly the entire district at risk, but all this work we've been doing for the last month plus to get these schools open could be shut down because we have some away games in one of these communities on a Tuesday when they're yellow and then Wednesday the report comes out and they're deep red and sure enough our children come back with COVID you know like that like that's I just don't I, I would need someone to reconcile all the precautions we're taking for students during the school day with how what's being proposed for athletics mainly traveling for games and that sort of thing and inviting other teams on how those things are not um how those things align, how those things are, are, are one and the same and are the same level of precaution. I need to figure out how that is true before I could ever support this. Again, you know, I, I would hate to see students miss out on sports and I appreciate normalcy, but these aren't normal times. This is a pandemic. And if it, you have a, a, a stunted season in the fall where it's practices only, like, you know, I'm sorry, we don't want anyone to get sick unnecessarily. So I, I would just need the information next week, how this aligns with everything else we're doing. Thanks. Melissa? 
So a couple of things. It's my understanding Rockport took this vote tonight, and I think they did something similar. Um, they voted subject to their Board of Health um, weighing in at a later date, um, just to put that food for thought out there. Um, Brian, what sports did you say? Um, is it cross, cross country and golf? So those are non-contact sports. So it seems to me there could be decisions within this decision. If, if most of the committee felt uncomfortable about the tighter sports where there's more contact, I mean, golf, you're pretty far away. Cross country, I'm sure you run farther away from other people. Um, so I, I think there's a compromise in all this. If, if the committee's not comfortable making a vote tonight, that's one thing. But like I said in the beginning, this is about making choices. I'm not going to be the one to tell a parent that they can't play a school sport. I think it's a, a parent's choice. And also keep in mind, there's other private sports organizations going on. Kids are playing hockey. Things are happening out there. Whether it's school-related or not, there are sporting events going on. Private schools are open. They're doing sports. You know, it's not like we're the first community to do this. You know, you have all these other communities that have voted to do it. You know, it's, it's, I don't see Gloucester being different. Um, but just keep those things in mind. I mean, I understand that we don't have enough information tonight, but I don't want our kids to lose out if the information comes back to be that we can get to yet. So well, Rockwood has no to... problem. Rockwood didn't ask the city for $1.4 million. They're on remote. So they don't have to worry about one for just to run the schools. So if you well, want we to have, use, we have money in our yeah, budget. You're talking about budget. transportation, board of health, and everything else in uh -huh. a budget. You're looking at schools that are doing 100% remote, so they don't have no fear of the teachers or anything else. And the the uh, transportation, we haven't ever discussed that, Melissa. Well, no one here no. is saying we're against okay. sports. No one's saying we don't want sports. We just want better answers yeah. to how the people all are going to have access to sports. How the and I think that's okay. what I said. Right. Yeah, but he said right there, the track, meet, the track meets could meet all day. How are they going to get there? And all right, we're going to table this until next Wednesday. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question? I've been raising my hand patiently. Okay. Thank you. Brian, in your, um, one of your slides said that because we were starting remote, the school committee needed to approve this. Is that, is that true? Yes, that's from that came, I believe, from Desi. James might be able to say. Um, I so, thought if we were starting hybrid, we wouldn't need to approve this. It wouldn't have to be approved. Um, I mean, obviously, as we even said before, we would want to bring everything to our school committee. But uh, like Peabody's situation, I believe, I think they're hybrid, so they officially don't have to go through the school committee. But I mean, I, I echo almost everything that Joel said. And I feel like if we were staying full remote, I'd almost be more comfortable with this because those students wouldn't be going back into the building and then, you know, possibly infecting their cohorts, right? So it seems a little counter to, you know, if, it, if we were going hybrid, it seems safer to be full remote than to, to do it in a hybrid model. Um, so that's really confusing to me. So I guess I'd like a little bit more clarification on why that decision is as it is. Um, I don't know if anybody has a sense of why we would need to approve it as a full remote option versus, is it just because there's this assumption that we're in the, in the red if we're full remote? I, I don't know the, the reason, the rationale behind what, why Desi made the decision, but let, I'd just be clear with the committee here. In these times, I would always bring this decision to you. Okay, I wouldn't go forward with this decision without uh, at the very least consulting and most likely asking for your, your vote and your support. So I, I, I don't know if that helps, but I just wanna be clear that regardless of what Desi is saying about when we have to vote or not, this would come to here. I, I couldn't do it either way. Because of the concerns you're raising. That, that's the exact, exact reason. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just, I was sort of confused about what the expectation was. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. I know, Jonathan, you want to move on, but I have a couple of things to say. One, in terms of the concern about equity and and who who can and can't play, I have seen tremendous generosity and inclusion in every sport that I've that I've witnessed. And to me, it seems like if we have budget for one bus, you'd prioritize those kids that you know for sure. Um, 
you know, you'd ask who has a ride and who needs to be on the bus and you would kind of get a count. Otherwise you'd have too many parents anyway, volunteering or not enough. So I, I think the equity aspect of, of transportation can be handled by the village of that sports community quite well. And, I, and I've seen it happening all the time. Um, I know kids are playing in other sports venues and other sport organizations, like Melissa said. Um, and so we're not keeping, and I realize this is a sanctioned, um, you know, school sanctioned thing. Um, you know, but, but you know, I, I look forward to the information. I hope it supports that this is, you know, a safe, you know, similarly safe as our hybrid model to getting kids together. Um, I do know that our kids have been good, at least on the soccer field with their masks and, and everybody's very respectful of what they need to do to have this privilege. And I know the families and the kids view it as um, something they really want to do, but also something that they know is a privilege in this time. Um, they're asking quite, quite politely and quite respectfully. So I, I do hope we get the information we need so that we can address this next week. Can we move on? So um, the last piece would be about the mask policy. And Jonathan, should we shift into that now? Um, sure. It, it's um, there. There are no committee reports, I don't believe, and uh, we're going to action, and that's one of the action items. So uh, let's move on to uh, um, the face mask uh, policy, um, file E, B, C, F, A. Wait a minute. Uh, so I just wanna show you just a quick update and summary. You have the revised policy for the second reading um, there, one second here. But I just wanna show you, just summarize the changes that have been made based on the committee's uh, conversation last week. Uh, here we go. So, um, so the school committee, just for the public's uh, update and knowledge, school committee is considering extending the face coverings requirement to K-12 and possibly preschool. Since last meeting, we've gathered input from the Gloucester Department of Health, uh, preschool staff, and also Pathways. Uh, Director Amory Jordan is here to give you an update on that information gathering if you'd like it. In terms of changes from the first reading, the changes in language that you requested um, was extending to younger grades. Uh, that's in the, you, these changes are in red on your copy. Um, adding a recommendation from the Dep Director of Special Education and also consultation with, with the Superintendent on individual, individual ex exceptions. Uh, we added language on developmentally appropriate response to, in, to the inability or refusal, refusal to wear a mask. The committee discussed uh, last week about if we're going to younger ages, um, we can't uh, sort of hold them, these younger children, accountable to something they're not maybe capable of doing as well as a older student may. And therefore, you need to have a development, developmentally appropriate response in terms of um, to those students. Um, depending on their age, their grade level, that sort of stuff, maturity level. Um, and then added language that masks should comply with the Massachusetts Department of Health recommendations. Um, at part of last week's conversation was um, uh, Mr. Favaza talking about, you know, rather than having a, a set list of what's acceptable now, we refer to something that can change, but that is, um, but that uh, you don't have to revise the policy every time there is a change, because as we know, COVID guidance changes. Um, and, and in talking to Karen Carroll, she suggested, as she did tonight to you, um, she just says to me that we referenced Massachusetts Department of Health um, and, and their guidance on it, basically. And we can then use that guidance to, to give to our schools and our families about what's appropriate. And we've used some of that language she talked about tonight. So that's just to give you a summary to get folks back up to date where we are. And then I'll hand it over to you folks for the discussion and, and deliberation. Okay, we, uh, we are entertaining the, um, the second reading of the face um, mask covering, face coverings, it just says, uh, file E, B, C, F, A. And um, let's just start with um, 
the most recent copy that has the um, uh, the highlighted and read the the um, adjustments that we made last week. Um, does everybody agree that this is uh, where we're starting? Does someone need to move to waive the reading? Is that how this works? We, yeah, we can. We can. If you are, we can read it. I move uh, that we waive the actual reading of the policy. Second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Taken? Yes. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yes. Kathy Clancy? Yes. Mr. Favazzo? Yes. Chairman Pope? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes. Okay, it passes unanimously. So uh, now um, we need a motion. Um, uh, well, I'll go back to the, what I just said before that. Is, uh, is everybody in agreement that this is um, what we have before us is what we, because um, uh, we didn't, we, you know, we made changes um, as we were going last week. And uh, this is, uh, is this where we're at for a start? It's not what we're going to agree to in the end, but is, is this, uh, where we're starting. Joel. To me personally, I think the changes made reflect the conversation we had. I'm wondering if it'd be possible for our attendees, if maybe um, Ms. Flemis could screen share this part of the agenda, just so if people are watching at home, they can see what we're talking about when we talk about it. The actual document? Yeah, yeah with, with the, the red line in it. With the red line, it, yeah. Sure, give me a moment, just let me. Just if you guys keep talking, we'll get it up there. <laughs> okay, well, we can keep talking. Um, um, Laura? Well, I, I would love to hear from Anne-Marie about um, what, you know, what she's learned about both pathways and the preschool and, you know, what, how people are feeling at the preschool level um, as the next step as we discuss this. Okay. Uh, after Anne-Marie talks, then I'll put up the document. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, so uh, a, a few um, things. I did um, uh, reach out to path staff at Pathways and the Y, as well as some area, um, other community um, school districts about their policies and their perspective about young children, very young children wearing masks. Um, Pathways does not have a requirement uh, or the Y have a requirement for children to wear masks for er their early childhood programs. Um, and what they find is that, um, so some children, families do send their children with masks, but because it, even if it's encouraged, the expectation is that not all families, that all children will be wearing masks fewer children do wear masks. So there's not an opportunity for a lot of teaching around safety and how to wear a mask, et cetera. Um, there are a number of communities um, on, in the North Shore. I also reached out to the North Shore Education Consortium to their um, early childhood special education program. And there are a number of communities that are including preschool in their exception policies for um, early childhood K-1 and including pre-K. Um, similar to what you've spoken about regarding um, uh, 4K and 1, um, setting up an expectation of a requirement um, does not mean punitive measures um, related to wearing a mask or not, whether a family sends a child with a mask or not. However, it does provide staff with an opportunity to teach children about wearing the masks and helps encourage more children to wear masks successfully and therefore the encouragement piece is more successful if that the, the sentiment is if, if that requirement is there the encouragement actually leads to more young children wearing masks and more of an ability to really teach children about how to wear a mask why we wear masks, where we may wear masks, and how we appropriately take, put masks on and take them off. Um, in, uh, in asking our staff about their perspective, um, I, they, 
the majority of staff reflected um, the sentiments that I'm saying, which is they don't want to make a punitive requirement that if a, fam if a family doesn't send a child with a mask, that we're sending them home or we're doing anything punitive to that child um, or to the family. But, you know, it does provide an opportunity for slowly teaching children about the importance of wearing masks when they're in public places, if they're moving through the hall, we can really make sure that they're wearing masks when they're in areas where they, it's more important for them to wear masks. Additionally, with our six foot um, social distancing abilities in our classrooms, it also gives us the opportunity to um, give children appropriate and frequent mask breaks. Um, and that will also help them to increase their um, ability to sustain wearing masks because we are able to give them um, that opportunity for mask breaks um, at an appropriate time um, and still be safe within, within the outside of the six foot distance. Um, um, I think th that's, those are the most important pieces. I think that there's a sense that um, there's a consistency of message um, regarding why it's important for us to be safe with each other um, that the community gives to children. We give them that same message in school. Um, and it also provides us a better opportunity to teach students about that safety piece, as well as the mechanics of um, putting on masks and being able to keep masks on. I think that's the primary focus of the conversations I've had. Thank you. Um, so, as Joel said, I, I believe this um, accurately, accurately reflects um, the discussions that we had um, last week. Um, so do we want to um, move to um, the second reading, make a motion to uh, approve the second reading? Well, can I ask a question? Sure, Laura. Go ahead. Just given what we just heard from Anne Marie, I'm just wondering, does approving a second reading mean we're approving this version or can we still make amendments based on what Anne Marie just told us? We, we can make amendments. Okay. But we need to get the, a motion on the table to then make the amendments. I move that we approve the second reading. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion there? Um, and this is where, uh, we make amendments. Um, I would just like to point out, though, that what this says is it's for grades K-12. Um, whenever possible, students in pre-kindergarten who can safely and appropriately wear, remove, and handle masks should do so. So it's, it, it, it's, it's um, K-12. Okay. Laura? Um. So what I understood Anne-Marie to say, and please correct me, Anne-Marie, if I'm wrong, is that the requirement allows preschool teachers to then set expectations and encourage young children to wear masks, um, whereas the whenever possible does not uh, do the same thing. Is that, am I understanding correctly? That's correct. Great. So then it would seem to me that the language would change to this policy pertains to all students in grades pre-K through 12. And we would take out the next line about pre-kindergarten. And then we've clearly added that, you know, there's not going to be a punitive, there's not going to be a punitive issue around a small child not wearing a mask or their family. Um, and if we need to spell that out more clearly, then we can do so. Um, would you like to offer an amendment? I would like to amend. This policy pertains to all students in grade pre-K through 12, and then the deletion of the whenever possible students in pre-kindergarten who can safely and appropriately wear, remove, and handle masks should do so. I would delete that second sentence. That's, um, and I so move. Mm -hmm. We have, I, I can't see everybody, okay. so um, just speak up, please. Okay, we have a motion and a second on amendment. Um, is there any discussion on the amendment? 
I have a, some discussion. I just want to make sure because I'm getting everyone else is getting messages too. That for children who really can't this this they can't wear and they have sensitivity to the issues of masks, we'll be able to bring a doctor's note or Patty will be able to say yes, they they're not allowed to wear a mask and they'll be fine. Correct. That's correct. Okay, just want to make sure that's clear. It's in there because there are some parents who ask. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? Like I say, I can't I see anybody, so just speak up. Melissa? I just have a question, a procedural question, and you think I'd know this. So by, if we approve this amendment, we're approving the policy, and that's our policy, correct? Unless we need to bring it back for no, further we, discussion. No, we approve the amendment. Point. We approve the amendment and then we approve the policy. It's two votes. Right, but I mean tonight though. So once we do this tonight, we approve the amendment and then go back to the original vote and vote that this is the policy. Yes. Okay, just one big quick. Which we can change next week if we have to. Right, yeah, yeah. no, I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is, uh, Laura, go ahead. I just, I just wanna ask the question if we um, need to spell out more clearly um, that there would be no punitive. Um, the, the, oh. we're, 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 we're discussing the amendment. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So that's, okay. Sorry. Right. We can get to that when we discuss the whole policy or we're going to ask for another amendment. But uh, right now we're discussing the amendment. Um, so I, I'll say it again, I can't see everybody, but um, I'm not seeing anybody or hearing anybody. So um, we have a, a motion uh, for an amendment to... Um, Joel has his hand up. I don't know if he's waiting or that was a mistake. That was on the, the base motion, so I'll hold off until we're back. Okay, so this is on the amendment. And the amendment is that we would uh, change um, the... Um, second sentence in the um, uh, second paragraph uh, that says this policy pertains to all students uh, pre-K -K to 12. And then we would strike the following sentence, wherever possible students in pre-K uh, who can safely and appropriately wear, remove and handle masks uh, should do so. Okay. Yeah. Any... Jonathan, I have a question okay. on this particular amendment. So yeah. um, the way it reads, it says by all individuals in school buildings, and then this sentence specifically addresses students. It doesn't say um, staff and students and visitors. And I just want to make sure we're clear, all individuals means all individuals. And, um, and so should the wording be um, something like, I, I just want to make sure the wording is clear that there's no loopholes, that it's only for students, right? I mean, it's all individuals. So right. I, guess, I just want to emphasize that. I don't think I need a, an amendment. I just want to emphasize that. In school buildings or on grounds. And further on, the um, it talks about visitors. So I, I, I think it covers everybody. All right. So if there's no further um, discussion on the amendment, uh, Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Taken. Mayor yes. Taken? Yes, I'm here, yes. Thank you. Ms. Watson? Yes. Ms. Wieson? Yes. Kathy Clancy? Yes. Mr. Favaza? Yes. Chairman Pope? Yes. And Ms. Prince? Yes. Ms. Prince? Yes, sorry. Okay. So the amendment carries um, unanimously. So as amended, um, and it looks like um, Ben is changing it on the fly um, for us. Um, and now on the, uh, back to the um, original motion, uh, the second reading of this policy, uh, Kathy. I have another amendment um, to add in that same paragraph, but the first sentence, it uh, where it says, even when socially distancing is observed, comma, unless an employee is working in an office, classroom, or other room, or on school grounds by themselves. Um, and um, yeah, so that's my amendment. Okay, so that's... I'll second that for discussion. 
Okay, so can you, can you tell me again where that is? Uh, it's the same uh, paragraph we just amended, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right before it, Melissa. And what are you, what are you adding? You're adding? I'm adding I'm to that. To, I'm just trying to understand, that's all. Sure. Um, to that first paragraph, first sentence, it says a face covering that covers the nose and mouth must be worn by all individuals in school buildings, on school grounds, and on school transportation, even when social distancing is is observed, comma, unless an employee is working in an office, classroom, or other room, or on school grounds by themselves, period. So when we were getting a presentation at one of the thousand meetings we've had in the last two weeks or whatever it is. I, I don't know if it was Mr. Cook, but someone was, was explaining that currently teachers were allowed to be maskless in their classroom if they were in their classroom by themselves. But it was the expectation that once the schools opened and were gonna become buildings in which people were gonna be you know, in and out of there, that if you were gonna be in these buildings, even if you were in a room by yourself, they were gonna expect teachers to remain masked for their safety and for students' safety. And so I'm nervous that this amendment being offered contradicts you know what we had been told by i think it was principal cook it could be wrong but I, this was definitely brought up um so i'm just curious about that uh kathy so my amendment comes from the fact that practically speaking our superintendent is sitting in his office by himself right now so he'd be in violation of policy Second thing I'm thinking is if a teacher has a break and wants to go outside in the corner of a playground by themselves, um, if they stay after school by themselves, I just want the policy to be, um, I don't want to, I don't want to give an inch to, to, you know, have them take a mile. I just want it to be practical where there is no safety implication and you know the expectation would be they have a mask handy right if someone walks in the masks go on um that that's the expectation but i didn't want anybody getting in trouble who stays or who goes in early and closes their door to get some work done and and have somebody think they're in violation of this policy melissa so i think there has to be a compromise here and i'm going to be a little bit um more cautious than i usually am so with all, all that's going on in the world about aer aerosol and, and things still lingering in the air, so I'm, in my, I'm, in, I'm a teacher and I'm in my classroom by myself, um, and then someone walks in, I have to reach for my mask and grab it, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm torn between both, you know, I, I can see both sides to that, I mean, yes, I, I wouldn't expect Ben to have a mask on, but unless a teacher can guarantee that they're going to stay alone, I would want them to have a mask on. So how do we find a compromise to that is what I'm interested in. Because of course, if you know you're not going to be around anybody or if you're taking a mask break, there should be no, no concern about it. But to think that you're going to be alone and then you're not alone, that, that's where I have a concern. And if we're pushing little kids to wear masks, that not all schools are doing, I would expect that the teachers are going to be just as responsible and that they'll want to be responsible. I don't even think it's going to be an issue. Um, so I, I don't want to just give a blanket okay that if you're alone, you don't need your mask. So how do, if, is there a compromise there to be found somehow? What if it's or, only, I mean, I think most of the members probably okay if we just remove classrooms from it, right? So again, if if you're a staff member who has an office that at most, you know, one or two other staff members might come in, but that, you know, again, to Kathy's example and to Melissa's example as well, the teachers in their room before school begins and they're maskless and, you know, God forbid they're asymptomatic, but spreading. And then, oh, the bell rings, put my mask on and then a bunch of students pile into a room that, you know, theoretically is more airborne particles and otherwise would have, again, this is a problem with the school committee having to make these decisions and not the health department because I'm not an expert. And despite all the help the DBW has been giving us as far as air circulation, you know, I just don't know. And so I'm, I'm inclined to err on the side of caution um, and, and just at least remove the classroom from that amendment. Melissa. Can I, um, can I, you can't see my hand, but um, okay, go right ahead. Well, not for nothing. Everyone leaves the school. My custodians are not wearing masks. 
Okay, so you gotta, you have to understand, everyone's out of the school, they're cleaning up. They, if they need to take a break, they can't go in a, pr a private classroom, they'll go in the, the little cubby hole or whatever. But what I'm saying to you is that if a teacher's in her office or their teacher, sorry, I keep saying she, if I'm in my office, I've got staff. You came into my office today, you were six feet apart, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't wear my mask. You know what? That's our choice. Those particles, the nurses, every day it changes. If a nurse needs, a, or I'm sorry, I keep saying nurse. We asked Karen Carroll, I've asked her before, six feet if you can't, let's say you're a Delta or whatever. We're not talking on one another. We're not spinning. If a teacher needs a break and she knows that her kids are wherever they may be out of the classroom, if someone comes in, they're going to have, they're going to say, hold on. You know, you're not going to breathe in. By the time they get to there, the particles are gone. You know, the 12 hour thing is gone, everything else, but the teachers or anyone else or anyone in their office is going to need a break from these masks. Are you going to tell them they're going to have to run to the bridge if they're at the high school or run outside to have like a, 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 a five minute? If they have no one in their classroom and they are sitting there by themselves and no, you don't expect anyone to come in, usually you knock. If someone just, hey, what's going on, so and so, wait a minute, put the mask on. Keep, they need, where are they going to have their mask breaks? You're going to have, you have students have a mask break, but you're not going to give one to the teacher or the, the secretaries or whoever's in the building. You got to give them breaks because even in our buildings, you have to have a break. You got to go somewhere where you can be alone to have a break. People do it all the time. You need a break. It, the particles aren't what they used to say. Because look, they would have shut me a long time ago. They said, the more you scream, the more the particles come out. Then they would have closed my mouth shut a long time ago. So let me tell you something. It changes all the time. But these teachers need a break. They need a break. If they're in a classroom, that's their decision. Tell them to lock the door so they have to knock before they get in. And if the doors don't lock, well, we'll have to get new ones, won't we? But the fact is, you know what? We have to give these teachers a break. They're going to need a break. Would you or I like a mask on eight hours, five hours constantly without a break in between? It, you know what? You go to the teacher's lounge, they're going to have to wear the mask. They go here, they're going to have to wear the mask. But if they're in their own comfort of their own room, doing grades, doing whatever, just a break, five minutes, you should have a courtesy as another adult before you walk in a room or before you go in there, you're in enough difference between the door and their desk that six feet that gives you time to put that mask on. We're going a little bit too much cautious. Yet you're going you're gonna to put everyone on a bus and couple to, to go play sports, but yet you're going to punish a teacher in the classroom who needs a, who needs a mask break. I don't know. Um, so I meant to add this last time. I don't know if something new came out today about this, but as I was home from work today, I got a text from my boss at about two o'clock saying, effective immediately, we have to wear our mask all day. Now, we weren't wearing our mask if we were alone in an office. So I don't know what caused her to say that. Um, I work for the state. I don't know if some sort of directive came out today. But now when I go to work, I have to wear my mask the whole time I'm there, even when I was alone. So I would just want to look to find out if something came out today to, that, that triggered that, because I know it wasn't just a decision that was made out of the blue. So I don't know how we find that out. Laura? And I'm not trying to be difficult, because I'm all about mask breaks. I'm somebody who hates to wear masks. So I'm just um, putting that out there. Laura? Um, I'm just going back to my copy of this. Um, so now that we're digging into this sentence, I have a question and then tell me if it's not appropriate now. So what this says is must be worn by all individuals in school buildings, on school grounds and on school transportation. However, we're talking and I actually spoke to a teacher yesterday, they're talking about they have to give kids snack breaks and mask breaks and I know at least in one case, they're hoping to give them to them outside. So how, you know, they're going to put them six feet apart to have their snacks, but they can't be wearing masks. So um, now that we're looking at this, like, I, I don't, I know this was initially the MASC policy, um, but it sounds like we're going to have to build in a whole bunch of exceptions to make this workable, including being part of what Kathy said, and also just the idea that mask breaks have to happen somewhere well, for kids and parents. Amendment, right? All right. Well, let's let's get back to um, the amendment that uh, that um, Kathy offered, um, and we can come around to that one. 
Um, so, so let's uh, just to be clear, um, uh, the amendment is, Kathy, maybe you could repeat it. I, I won't get it quite right. So to the first sentence, add, unless an employee is working in an office, classroom, or other room, other room or on school grounds by themselves, period. So that'd just be right at the end of the sentence. Correct. Uh, even, even when social distance, unless, okay. Okay. So everybody understands it. Joel, please. Yeah, so, so again, and this is where, you know, I, I admit in the beginning, I'm not a health expert, but I'm trying to reconcile all the information that we're receiving from all these different people. And one of the pieces of information we are receiving from um, DPW is that we are going to run our HVAC systems earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon to flush air out and get new air into these rooms, you know, more effectively or to, to a higher degree, which suggests to me that the problem we're trying to avoid is, although people may have left the room, these virus particles may still be suspended in the air for some time. And the only way to get them out is to refresh this air, again, by in part running these systems before and after school longer. So if we are taking precautions because we are recognizing that even when people are in the room, the virus may persist in the room, I don't know how a teacher who even very diligently masks up when someone walks in the room won't have created the, pro if God forbid they're asymptomatic, but, you know, um, but contagious, how they wouldn't have you know put virus particles into the air that would then be suspended in the air and even though the teacher has masked up very diligently when students or colleagues come in those students and colleagues would now be in a room with virus particles that we are taking other steps at other parts of the day to flush out it's, does that make sense like I, I just don't see again how those two things reconcile and the problem again being i'm not a health expert so that might be why i'm having trouble melissa so I'm wondering if the compromise is, because I, I don't necessarily feel comfortable with Kathy's language, but I also know as an adult that if I was in a room by myself and when I couldn't get caught, I'd probably take my mask off. But I'm wondering if we can put in here that there's an expectation that teachers or staff or anybody will responsibly take mask breaks when needed, you know, appropriately. So if a teacher finds themselves in a situation where they know nobody's going to be around, they know they can take a math break. But they As need opposed, one. Right, if they yeah. need one, you know what I mean? So I, I instead of just saying, do it if you're alone, um, let's kind of not say that, but say there's an expectation that staff are gonna take math breaks and being responsible adults that they are, they'll know when they can take a math break. And it's not something they'd be disciplined for. So if they, you are like, Mr. Lummis in a room by yourself and you want to take a math break because you know nobody's around, nobody's coming around, there's nothing wrong with that. And if a teacher knows that no one's, they're in a spot, they're in a private room or a room, teacher's conference room by themselves or something and you know no one's coming, then they take a math break. You know, I mean, there's got to be an expectation to take math breaks, but we can't keep math on all day. It just doesn't happen. What if the classroom stuff was limited to after the school day, the, the student school day is over? I agree the office yeah. thing makes sense because the office is a very low potential. You know, I, Mr. Lemus can tell you, I assume there's a limited number of people circulating in and out of his personal office during the day. It's not zero, but it's not the number of students that'll be coming in and out of a classroom during a day. And so again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind an office thing being perpetual, but the classroom, it just seems to me we're taking all these precautions to flush air out of these classrooms because we're so concerned about the air maintaining this virus despite humans no longer being present in it, that we'd at least say, okay, after the students have gone home, if you're in a classroom by yourself, you can pop the mask off, but otherwise you can do, you know, whatever it is, go outside or go to Disney did something for your mask break. I, I don't know. Melissa, you still have your hand up you. Kathy. So, so Melissa, I'm, I'm okay with your language, except I just want to make sure it's clear enough that um, other staff feel comfortable, right? So what one person thinks is responsible and someone else comes in 
and you know if there's a few people in a room right and two people say oh well, we're far apart we're taking a mass break right you know what i'm saying i just don't want it to be and then the third person comes in is uncomfortable i just want I wanted it to be clear enough that there's not the potential to put anybody else in an uncomfortable situation to have to say, this is not an appropriate time, right? My issue was more, more kind of an enforcement, like what's the enforcement versus what is, what's comfortable for one person versus not comfortable for another. So that's really, I mean, I, I, I think we're working in the same spirit um, so I'm, I'm open to the language. So appropriate is a subjective word. I mean, we can all think of it differently. We all know teachers are very concerned about their health. Um, I find it hard to believe that teachers that want all the protection that they're asking for are going to be in a room where they're going to take a mask off in front of somebody and say, I'm just taking a break. I mean, we, we're obligated to give them a break. But at, a, at an appropriate time, which wouldn't be when you're in a room with somebody else right there. And that's just common sense. So, like I said, we're, we're talking about adults, not kids. They're entitled to break. There's going to be an expectation that there's going to be times during the day where they may not, they can take a break and take their mask off. And we let them make that decision. And if it becomes a problem, then it becomes a problem and somebody talks to somebody about it. I mean... I don't think we're dealing with something difficult here, but to, just to say that if you're in a room by yourself, you can take your mask off, not knowing what could happen 10 minutes later, I have more concerns with that than I do someone taking their mask off while they're talking in, in front of a, another staff member um, and then being um, not responsible by taking their mask off and saying, I'm taking a break. <laughs> what We have some teachers that aren't gonna get through at 12, correct? Because I just got a text from someone saying, I have special needs. I don't get done at 12. I'm going to need a, a break and the school's not going to be empty. So, but no one's going to be in my room until another. So I'm not going to be able to take the mask off in my room to breathe. No. It's the same thing, people. They're adults. It's the same thing saying, okay, so that teacher comes in with the doctor's note saying she's going to have to have a break. I mean, we need to make it where it's reasonable, where it's going to be effective, where they can say, okay, you have a window, open the window, take a break, take the mask off, go outside. I mean, they're... They, first of all, they're the ones who are telling us what they want for air quality. I, I'm sure there are adults in there, and they are teachers, and there are people who are in there who know what, what the right protocol is. Like we said, COVID didn't come with the book people. We're, we're going to end up having another meeting until 1.30 in the morning talking about mask and quality of ear, uh, air, where we're just saying, okay, but you're going to have contact sports. You can go carpool. You can go on the bus. You can do this. You can do that. What I say is leave it alone. And it's up to the, the the school principal. If they're saying that they, you know, what they get complaints, then they can bring it forward. But it's up to the schools and the principals themselves to say, and you know what, teachers, work with us. Not for nothing, I'm going to say something. City Hall, you think that we don't get breaks? You don't think we need to breathe? Police department, the fire department. We haven't come down with COVID. And we got older buildings in which you're in now. It, it, Melissa, you've been working for how long now they told you put it? And now at the end, all right, you know, since March till now, it's called common sense. We're going to fight until 1.30 of what's right. When You're right, Joe, we're not nurses or doctors or anything else, don't know. You know what, let's leave it as is. And if we have to change it, then when Karen can say, well, you know what, we are no longer green. We're going to have to change it. But right now we're green. Let's leave it as is and let them to have a, a break with their mask. And it's common sense. And then if someone else complains, then let the principal deal with it and come forward. Okay. So um, what I'm hearing is that there's an amendment on the on the table about uh, that Kathy has offered um, uh, about people can take their masks off and if they're in the room alone. Um, I Melissa, am, I'm happy to withdraw my motion so Melissa can propose her language. Okay. All right. Well, so, wait. Motion's withdrawn. And um, Melissa, you want to propose the language about uh, taking breaks? Well, okay, so we can do two things. We can just withdraw the language and see what happens and just let everybody take a break when they feel is appropriate. Or we can just add language somewhere in the policy that says there's an understanding that there'll be mass breaks during the day. I mean, there's going to be mass breaks during the day whether you put the language in there or not, because that's what people do. Exactly. So, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I'd rather just leave it as it is and see what happens and if there's any problems. Exactly. With it, then we address it. 
common you sense. Know, I mean, okay. It's, it's easy. Okay. I think we are splitting gears here. Um, so let's. Uh, so Kathy has withdrawn her, her um, amendment. We're back to um, the second reading, the motion, and the um, seconded uh, for the second reading. Are there any further discussion? Laura. Well, I'm having trouble looking at the document. Um, whoops. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Ben, this is really a question for you. Um, it says, uh, face, okay, must be worn by all individuals in school buildings, on school grounds, and on school transportation, even when social distancing is observed. Um, it would seem to me that on school grounds, when social distancing of six feet is observed, kids can take off their masks for mask breaks. Or how do we put in there the fact that I know teachers are planning to do snacks and breaks outside? Uh, you, you Except are, during well, mask break. <laughs> right, you, you're, you're correct in what you said earlier and now, and now again, that uh, you may want to put some allowance for mask breaks because we have to take them. We know that teachers, you know, part of what they've been doing this this week is the last week is figuring out when and how to get mask breaks. So, right. you're correct, that's not in here at this point. And then, so language that could cover both, you know, adults and children, perhaps. Um, I think right. is where Melissa may have been heading. Um, and snacks for the little ones, because I know they're talking about that. Yeah, I, I would I would just caution everybody on getting too specific. Okay. How about you know? you know, allowing for mass breaks at the direction of, you know, okay. staff member. Um, we, we have been working on how to do that and, and, and you couldn't possibly put every, every nuance in there. Okay, so, so then my question is, do we just leave this everyone and see what happens? Fiction, right? What? <laughs> It's, we'd be approving a policy we know is going to be broken daily. And I, still, I mean, that just seems kind of like, you know, we're, we're right there. I think Melissa okay. and Kathy were real close. I think Laura's real close. Like, all right. So uh, it's just observed, except during, you know, sanctioned, sanctioned uh, mass, mass breaks break. or mass, you know, whatever, you know. I mean, it's, again, kind of like we did with the, the Department of Health reference. Can we point to just like, except in accordance with mass breaks? you know, as, I don't know. As needed. Or like, okay. I, I'm trying to say, like, what, what are mask breaks? There'll be something that either the, the superintendent's office will put out what mask breaks are, or the principals will put, like, we make that decision, then we don't have to get into the details, we just point at something else, say, except, you know, during mask breaks, you know, in conformance with, um, God, like, the building policy or the district policy or, or whatever you're trying to say like i don't want to make the decision tonight as well i thought you were saying god <laughs> no, why, don't, why don't we just add a line that says the administration yeah. will provide um uh, guidance um on uh, mass breaks and uh eating of snacks or mass breaks I, for for adults and children yeah i second that <laughs> make it a motion okay. So Jonathan, is that your motion? That's my, that was, well, it is now. Sure. <laughs> Are we going to have a, a truant that's going to go around and check all these things? I mean, it's a math <laughs> Yeah, I'm going, all right, it's up to the schools, the principals, and, and themselves. Yeah, well, it, it'll be it's, fine. It's we can just put it it'll in. It'll be the, fine. They're adults. Yeah. All right. So I, apparently that was a motion in a second. So the, uh, the, there's a motion and a second for a, an amendment to um, add a, a sentence at the end of the uh, um, the first second paragraph. Um, or should we put it in the middle there? Yeah, it should probably should. Um, um, yeah, right at the end of it, the, the administration will provide guidance on. Um, I'm, I'm just putting it. Yes, good. Helpful. Beautiful. I love it. Good. Okay. So we have a motion in a second, and we can see it now. Um, and we're going to get it in the right font, apparently. Um, and, 
Uh, and we're closing in on 11 o'clock, folks. Um, so uh, is there any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, seeing none, although I can't see you all. Um, uh, Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Watson. Sorry, yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Ms. Prince. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It carried, it, it carried unanimously. Now we're back to approving the um, the policy as amended. Is there any further discussion? And I'm, again, I'm going to put in an email. Feedback I received from the building principal and, and teachers today where they were appreciative that we were making the student experience homogenous between all the grades and they wouldn't have to deal with explaining why some students do things other students don't have to do, that sort of stuff. So I'm excited to get this done. Yes. Is there any further discussion? Um, and like I said, I can't see everybody. So if you speak up, if you have something to say, otherwise I'm gonna call for a vote, Maria. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. It carries unanimously. We still have um, um, uh, five minutes before 11 o'clock. Um, and we have a number of um, grants. We have um, three from the Gloucester Education Foundation, um, a totaling uh, $13,169.26. Um, the breakdown is in your packet. Um, one is for veterans in Plum Cove. Um, uh, the other one is for the high school. Um, and well, the other two are for the high school. Um, do we have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Other than I think we need to once again send a, a thank you uh, note to the Gloucester Education Foundation. Okay. Seeing no uh, discussion, um, roll call vote, Maria. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It carries unanimously. We have one other um, uh, grant, and that's um, for Project Bread, um, the Walk for Hunger for $3,750 COVID-19 rapid response grant. Um, and the backup is in your packet. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none. Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Yes. Okay. Um, we have um, Joel, don't on, uh, on the agenda, we have the approval of the um, 2020-2021 elementary uh, student handbook. Um, I'm not, do we, um, do we have that? I don't see it in my packet. I don't see that at all. Where I don't that? see it at all. I don't see it on the agenda. Yeah, That's not on the agenda. Okay, well, I got, pulled that off. Pulled it off. Okay, well, I got the uh, old agenda or, this or something. Okay, forget it. Um, MSBA update, I just wanna say that we have, um, just to um, maintain the, the idea of having a meeting every night, uh, we um, have scheduled the uh, joint uh, school committee, um, city council meeting for next Tuesday at six o'clock. Um, it's a one um, item agenda. We'll get a presentation from 
um, Doran Whittier about the submission um, and also some information about um, what the alternatives are should the uh, override uh, debt exclusion fail. And we'll also get some uh, information from John Dunn um, about how um, the breakdown of the payments, uh, how the money will work uh, to pay for the override and um, pay for the debt exclusion. The school, pay for the school, excuse me. De thank you. And, um, and that's all uh, very positive. I got a preview of that today and it's, um, and it's, um, it should be good. So that's gonna be at six o'clock on Tuesday night. Um, and also, um, we we're supposed to go into executive session, um, but um, for those of you who uh, um, watched yesterday, you, you, the, we didn't make any um, progress um, yesterday in negotiations. Um, uh, they promised mm -hmm. lots of progress for tomorrow night. Um, so I don't know um, unless Melissa thinks there's something, uh, uh, some update that we need to inform the committee of. I'm, I'm don't think we need to go into executive session for anything. I'm not sure what we do. So it's um, eleven o'clock, and um, good night. And we're all yawning. Motion yeah. to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> um, uh, Maria, roll call vote. Goodbye. Yes, goodbye. Good night. I got a, I got a 7.30 Zoom meeting. Thank you. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wieson. Yes. Good night. Nancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. And Ms. Prince. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.